just take a moment to allow your eyes to close and allow yourself to begin to relax. And as you begin to relax, I don't know whether you'll relax deeper to the sound of my voice or whether it'll be to the spaces between my words. And as you begin to comfortably drift asleep, I'm just going to tell this sleep meditation in the background. And it's a sleep meditation about a woman who is walking through a meadow. And as she walks through this meadow, the sun is beginning to set. And she sits down in the meadow on that grass and watches as that sun sets on the horizon. And while she's watching the sun setting, she picks a dandelion from among the grass and she gently blows the top of that dandelion. And it seems like hundreds of tiny sparkles spread from that dandelion towards that setting sun as the moonlight begins to fill the meadow. And as that silvery moonlight begins to fill the meadow and the sun sets over the horizon, she watches those sparkles spreading away from the dandelion, spreading off in all directions slowly floating through the air. And she continues to just watch those sparkles floating away. As the grass shimmers and sways in the moonlight. And a blueness begins to set over the meadow. And she feels this sense of regeneration happening to the land as she notices tiny sparkles of light beginning to settle across the grass and throughout this meadow. And as those sparkles settle she can see the way the trees off in the distance seem to be glowing and pulsating as if regeneration is happening from the roots up through those trees up to the leaves and the whole land around her seems to be beginning to glow under this moonlight with a subtle purple light, a subtle blue light pulsing and spreading from within the ground to the tips of the blades of grass, to the tips of each leaf on the trees. And she notices as she pays close attention a slight humming sound as the land seems to be pulsing with energy and regenerating. And while she rests there on that meadow, she's curious about the experience that's happening aware that normally she can sit down in a meadow. The sun sets, the moon rises, but it's generally relatively uneventful. Just an experience that brings a deep sense of peace and calm. And yet here, something about this meadow and this night is different. 
And as that moon continues to move gently across the sky, she feels this sense of peace, calm and comfort, leading her to lie back on that grass. And as she lies back on that grass, she can feel the blades of grass tickling the back of her neck, tickling by her ears, tickling around her arms, her palms of her hands. She can feel the softness and the gentleness of that grass. And she can notice a certain sensation going with that hum through that grass. And she can notice as she lies down on that grass, that glowing light spreading out all around her through this meadow, through the distant trees, and beginning to pulse around her. And as the night continues on, so that pulsing increases until that light begins to totally envelop her. And it goes from her looking up towards a sky of darkness and stars to seeing light in every direction. And as that light increases, so she closes her eyes. And as she closes her eyes, she can notice through her eyelids that the light is still increasing and getting brighter and brighter. And that humming seems to be coming from all directions around her. And as that brightness increases, she has this feeling like the brightness is almost like daylight. And then the humming begins to subside. And she can still feel that softness of the grass. And she gently opens her eyes. And as she opens her eyes and gazes up towards the sky, so she notices that everything has become calm and still, that she's experiencing a deep sense of serenity. And that there's an ethereal sense to this world around her, that the sky doesn't quite look like a normal daytime sky and not enough time has really passed. That it was only a moment ago that night time was setting in. And she looks to the left and looks to the right while lying down still on that grass. And everything has a soft focus glow. Everything seems to be swaying and moving so calmly, so gently. And she has this feeling like there's something different about where she is. It all looks familiar. The meadow looks familiar. The trees are where they should be, but there's a certain soft focus, an ethereal quality to what she can see. And she knows not enough time has passed for it to be a new day yet. And she stands up here and begins to walk through the meadow. She walks down through this meadow, 
heads down near the trees, all the way down to a river at the bottom of the meadow. And she stands near that river as that water trickles past. She runs her fingers through the water and she can feel the gentle coolness of the water, but notices that as her fingers pass through the water, so light seems to emanate and move around where her fingers are disturbing the water. And an almost twinkling bell sound comes from that water and from the movement. And she splashes some of that water on her face, feels the coolness of that water on her face and on her cheek. Before walking along the edge of this river, down towards a stone bridge, crossing that stone bridge, curious about the muted sounds here, the glowing, the ethereal light. She walks over that bridge, following a path. And she continues along this path until she sees some sparkling in the distance and she starts to head towards that sparkling and notices that it's light catching the windows of a glass building. And she arrives at that glass building with just the slightest brick frame around it. And she heads into that glass building where she sees a variety of plants all glowing in different colours, seemingly emitting coloured light. and hanging on a tree in this glass building, on a very small tree. It's a glowing orange fruit. And she reaches for that orange fruit, picks that orange fruit off the tree. Peels that orange fruit, can smell the sweetness, the inside of that fruit. Puts her nose near to the fruit, before taking some of that fruit and trying it. And as she does, she begins to have this experience of somehow almost becoming a bit like this world. She notices that her hands are starting to glow. Her body is starting to glow. That she's starting to emit light, like this land. And she heads out of that building. She walks along the side of the building and off in the distance. She sees somebody dressed in purple. And their purple robe is glowing and sparkling. And with every movement, it seems to twinkle and make the most beautiful sound. She walks to that person and as she gets closer she notices they're just standing there with their hands together, their eyes closed, 
pointing their head in the direction of the sky. And they seem to be meditating while standing up. And at first, they don't seem to notice her. Then she gets closer and closer to them. And once she's quite close, almost in reaching distance, she sees them move their head and turn slowly, carefully and peacefully to face her. And then they open their eyes and they smile. And she feels this deep sense of calmness with them. The sense that they're incredibly friendly and peaceful. And that they are at one with this world. And she asks them where this is, why this world is like this and explains that she had just closed her eyes to rest for a minute up on a hill on a meadow and that it was night time and now she's in this light area that's glowing and they explain that they are the genie and they're the genie in this land and that there's a connection between the land of the jinn and the land of humans and that they were passing through here and as they were passing through here she must have drifted into a reverie that allowed her access to the relevant frequencies to see this land. That it rarely happens because most people are so focused on jumping from A to B to C. They don't stop holding a frequency in their mind long enough to really notice that there's a land overlaying another land. That normally people just notice something out the corner of their eye. Or that the world just seems a bit brighter than usual for a moment. Or that they notice a shape or a slight sensation But normally, they don't hold that long enough to allow it to form, for them to perceive what's truly there. And the genie begins to walk back towards the river and begins to follow that river. And they follow the river down towards a lake. And the woman follows the genie. And they have a lot of questions that they want to ask. And so they think about the best way to ask those questions. And they ask about how it looked to them like all the nature was being regenerated as they were connecting with this alternate realm. And the genie says that as they travel around, a large area around them regenerates what it touches. And that it's almost like they travel around in a bubble of their reality in a bubble of their realm and that bubble of their realm 
stretches out from them. And they leave these patches of regeneration as they go. And the genie sits on a stone by that lake. And the woman sits on a stone next to them and continues to ask them questions. And the genie says to focus on the waterfall. And so the woman focuses on the waterfall on the other side of the lake and watches that waterfall as it glows and shines and sparkles while the water slowly descends as the spray sprays up speckles of light twinkling from the base of that waterfall and then the woman notices that those speckles of light twinkling up from the base of the waterfall seem to be moving erratically and off in different directions as if with volition rather than just splashes of water and the genie says that they're waterfall fairies that the energy of the water striking itself in this land triggers these waterfall fairies and they travel out and they find different creatures including humans and they settle down with a creature and they help to guide that creature to wellness They rest a hand on the shoulder of the creature. They reassure them. And they guide them towards positivity. Towards the future direction they would like to go. And they do what they can to help those who are perhaps struggling with the direction in life. and that the fairies are known by many names, often depending on the age and what the people think at different ages. Some may think of a fairy as a tooth fairy. Others may think of them almost like a guardian angel. People think of them as different things in different contexts. But their role is to bring something positive to the lives of those they touch. And that they leave the waterfalls looking like sparkling points of light. And they travel across the realms out of this realm and almost miraculously seem to appear in the human realm. And this genie explains how these realms are connected. That it's almost like multiple dimensions. And that this realm is just a higher level of dimension in the same way that if you put your finger onto a piece of paper then a two-dimensional being would see a solid mark appear in their two dimensions they would be able to approach it move around it but they wouldn't realize that finger was a three-dimensional object 
they wouldn't be able to even comprehend up. Only left and right, backwards and forwards. They wouldn't be able to comprehend down. And that here, what you're seeing and experiencing is a higher dimension. Where you're experiencing more than just the dimensions you're used to. And that that is what is giving it that strange, ethereal, experience, that it's your brain's way of interpreting this higher dimension in a way you can understand, but that fairies and genies and various other mythical creatures travel through the dimension. They can suddenly seem to appear and suddenly seem to disappear. And that where two points are connected to you isn't the same as two points here. That these higher dimensions can be almost like a way of travelling quickly between those lower dimensions. And the woman finds this all fascinating. And she asks the genie how you get back from here. Is she still in that meadow? Is she still really lying down on that meadow? And the genie explains that she is exactly where she is. And that anyone in the meadow would see her glowing and walking around just exactly as she is. But they wouldn't see this experience that she's having. But because she is from that realm, they would see her in that realm. But in her current position, she's across both realms. She's in all those dimensions. Whereas they are just in this dimension. And she asks how she returns to her dimension. And the genie says it's all a matter of frequency. But all you have to do is close your eyes and focus on being in the right dimension. Focusing on what you can see and hear in that dimension and begin to change those brain frequencies from this dimension to break the connection with here And that there are a rare few people who learn to be able to control their focus of attention to the point where they can move from one dimension to another, where they can be in both. And to some they'll appear to be glowing, perhaps with a certain colour associated with the frequencies that they're experiencing. And while they're in that state, they're able to communicate with those here in this dimension. 
while at the same time able to communicate that back to those in the other dimension. And the woman finds this fascinating, but wants to return to her normal dimension. So she rests down on a stone. She begins to focus on the sounds she knows would be in her normal dimension. And as she focuses on those sounds, so she notices the light beginning to fade, twinkling the sparkling and the sounds of the dimensions beginning to fade. And as she opens her eyes and looks around her, she sees that that genie has faded that she can no longer see the fairy flying from the waterfall. And she can hear the sounds of night time here again. She picks up another dandelion, blows that dandelion. And it spreads out perfectly naturally like normal. She breathes in some of the fresh night air. She then takes a moment to focus on being in the moment again. And as she does, so she begins to notice the twinkling, the sparkling, and then sees that genie again, who tells her that she's on the road to mastering this new skill of being able to traverse the realms, to be able to connect those realms, to travel from one to the other where she can then explore them both. And that when she comes here, she'll be able to discover what else is here in this realm, in the land of the Jinn. And that with practice, maybe, she can master being able to transfer her whole self from one realm to another and back again. And the woman then finds her way back to her normal realm, back to reality. She notices how dark the night is long after the sunset. She can see the way the stars are dancing in the sky. And after spending some time in the meadow, some time by the river, and down by the lake, she heads home and sits in a chair for a while, thinking about her experience and what it can teach her about her potential, about higher consciousness, about her ability to be in the moment. And then she heads to bed, settles down in bed, still thinking about how she can develop her ability and what it could mean for her future, and knowing she'll wake in the morning feeling so refreshed, revitalized, 
and clear-headed and looking forward to the day. She peacefully and comfortably drifts and floats so deeply asleep. So just take a moment to begin to relax and begin to drift comfortably asleep. And I don't know whether you'll drift asleep faster to the sound of my voice or whether it'll be to the spaces between my words. And as you begin to comfortably drift asleep, I'm just going to tell this story set in a savanna. And this is a story where you find yourself walking through a savanna. You can see the dancing haze on the horizon, the shimmering trees, the distant shimmering mountains. You can feel the warmth of the sun on your cheeks. And then sensation of each and every footstep that you take. And as you walk through this savanna, watching as some large birds of prey circle overhead, noticing herds of animals eating what they can and traveling across this land, and noticing other large animals roaming around. You see a curious sight. You see what looks like somebody painting. They appear to be stood before an easel and a canvas. And as you approach, you notice something unusual. You notice that this person stood at this easel is blind. And they keep putting their fingers into different paints and then spreading color onto the canvas and then washing their fingertips in a jar of water. Before seeming to concentrate on the sounds around them. And then reaching up a different color on their fingertips, adding something else to the canvas. And you ask them what it is that they're painting and how they know what they're doing. And you look at their painting and see what it is that they're painting. And they explain to you that they're listening to the land around them. They're listening for the locations that sounds come from and pinpointing different animals that make noise based on where in space they perceive the different sounds. They can hear the rustling leaves of trees. They can hear what to them it's almost like the twinkling of bells as the grass blows in a breeze. They can hear the deep breaths of animals. They can hear the footsteps of animals. Sounds of animals 
lying down onto the ground or standing up. And the different sounds of the way the different animals move and walk. They can feel the breeze on their face that lets them know which direction the wind is blowing and how that is likely to impact on the scene of any hair or fur or leaves or vegetation. They can notice the occasional change in temperature as clouds pass across the sun and get an idea from how long that temperature seems to be changed for, how large those clouds are and how frequent those clouds pass over the sun and so how frequent the clouds are likely to be passing across the sky. And you ask them how they know what colours to paint with. And they say that that's easy. Every colour absorbs light differently. And every colour has a slightly different temperature. And so they're able to tell what colours are what just from the temperature of those colours. And they can mix colours and tell from the temperature of the mixed colour roughly what colour that must be based on the temperature of it. And they can feel the size of the canvas in front of them. And they almost build up a mental representation of the scene around them and of that canvas and of what is on that canvas. And they're not painting to paint something that is photorealistic or realistic and recognisable to a sighted person. They're painting something which is a visual representation of their inner experience. Almost like a waveform while music is playing. It's a visual representation of the music. They're taking what they can hear about the world around them. Converting that in their mind into what it probably looks like. And it gives them a visual kind of feeling or representation in their mind. That this is their way of trying to explain that representation. And you can find this deeply interesting. And they suggest to you that maybe you'd like to try. And they tell you that there's another canvas on the ground. And they lift their canvas off the easel. They place their canvas down on the ground. They tell you to place your canvas in the place of theirs. They tell you to close your eyes. And with your eyes closed, gently move your hands forward. Find that canvas. Gently move your hands to the top of the canvas. 
slide your fingertips along the top of the canvas to the far corners. Feel the texture of the canvas under your fingertips. Feel your way to those two corners. Then gently feel your fingertips down the side of the canvas to the bottom two corners. And then feel your fingertips to the middle of the bottom and notice how you reach the easel as those hands move towards the center. Notice how your fingers can run along the easel while also touching the canvas where with your hands just gently relaxed fingers slightly spread, the thumbs, the forefingers, they can all meet around the middle of the canvas, while the far tips of your little fingers are still touching the edge of the middle of that easel, and so you can just move your hand down the canvas touching the edge of that easel, you'll know where your thumb is, and you'll know that that line from that point upwards is around the middle of the canvas, and then run your fingers up the canvas, and making circles with your fingertips so lightly touching that canvas, feeling the texture feeling how that canvas seems looser, less taut in the middle compared to nearer to the edges, especially nearer to the corners. And so with a sense of touch, you can be creating a representation in your mind with your sense of touch, your proprioception, to know where in space the different parts of that canvas are. So that by moving your hands around in circles, your arms around, reaching up and down, in very natural movements, you can have a true and honest sense of that easel in your mind's eye that represents the easel and the canvas in reality. And they said now, reaching down to the bottom of the canvas following that easel, just beyond that central lip, where your little finger judges the distance to the center. You can feel the tops of the paints. You can feel that jar that's slotted in near the end of the left side of the easel. And you can notice a jar off on the right side of the easel at the opposite location. And these jars just have water in that you can gently dunk your fingers in to rinse your fingers off. And then out in this savanna heat. Just a quick rub of those fingers dries them off, ready for your next bit of painting. And although they have never seen the colours, they know the experience of different colours.
and they direct your hand to the first colour near the water on the left and they tell you that the colours are the same but reversed on the right so that you can know that you can reach to the first colour near the water on either side and it will be the same colour and then you can reach to the second colour away from the water on either side and it will be the same colour and so you can dip your fingers into different colours and know that you can paint the same colour with both hands at the same time onto the canvas and they tell you that first colour is red they tell you to really pay attention as you just gently touch the top of that colour with your fingertips to pay attention to the sensation of that colour sensation of that paint, the temperature of the paint and then to wash your fingertips and allow those fingertips to dry and then touch the second colour and they tell you what colour this is they tell you to notice the texture, the sensations of touching that colour, the temperature of that colour. And they work through slowly, methodically, carefully teaching you and guiding you to experience what each colour feels like, what temperature each colour is. And you also know where each colour is. And a part of you wants to open your eyes and wants to see what it is that you're doing. But they tell you to just trust yourself. Trust that you have the ability to learn. There was a time before you had labels for anything. And then you grew up giving labels to things. You gave labels to the experience of the colour red. To what that colour red looks like. All you're doing is the same thing as you learn to do instinctively growing up. But you're allowing that to happen through your feelings, through your sense of touch. Through a greater awareness of the other sensory experiences of the colours. And after having a sense of where each colour is, and increasing in confidence at being able to tell one colour from another based on its temperature, based on what it feels like to touch. They tell you that to paint a picture you need to be able to experience that picture and that it's not about creating a visual representation saying this animal looks exactly like this and that animal looks exactly like that 
It's about recreating your inner experience, your experience of those animals, of the nature, without sight. and without touching those animals. That if you get to touch the animals, then you could create a very different representation of them. But this will just be a representation of your experience of hearing those animals. And you know some information about some of the animals. About their sizes, their shapes. But most of your painting will be based on what you can hear. And so they guide you to relax. They tell you to just Take a few deep, comfortable breaths, breathing in and breathing out, extending each out breath, breathing in and breathing out, extending that out breath further again and again, breathing in and breathing out and they tell you to just focus on almost being one with the world around you. That they'll count back from 20 and as they count, you can become stiller and quieter inside your mind. Reducing previous ideas and judgments to be able to be just in the moment on the experience and they start to count down in the background from 20, 19, 18, guiding you deeper and deeper into the experience, 17, 16, 15, 14, 13, going deeper and deeper, 12, 11, 10, 9, 8, Seven, six, as you go deeper and more experienced, almost like your senses are becoming heightened in the moment. Five, four, three, two. One, so deeply absorbed in the moment. And they tell you that now you're deeply absorbed in this moment, allowing yourself to become so calm and still, with your awareness spreading out with each out breath, breathing in comfort. Spreading that awareness out from yourself as if to connect with the ground, the plants, the trees, the animals, the sky with nature. And as you spread your awareness out, they said, just begin to notice 
feeling of the breeze on your face. Notice the difference in sensations between one cheek and the other. Notice the difference between the sensations on one ear and the other. Notice what the ground feels like under your feet. Take just a couple of steps on the spot to be able to notice the texture, how firm or soft that ground is. And that'll give you an idea of what that's likely to be for most of this environment. And just notice that you can reach down and gently lower your hand onto the ground and judge when the grass touches and tickles the underside of your hand and how long it takes and what the distance is between when that grass first touches and tickles your hand versus when that hand is flat on the ground. But you can move your hand around on that ground giving a sense of whether that grass is a similar height across this kind of ground, or whether it varies significantly in height. And listening closely, you can hear the movement of the grass as the wind blows a breeze. You can hear the sound of branches rubbing together in the trees, of the leaves rustling that can give you an idea of how many leaves are there. and how dense those leaves are. And being able to hear that distant lapping of water on a shore. knowing that somewhere over there is a lake. And breathing in, noticing the smells around you, the smell of that distant water, the smells of different plants, and other smells around you. Perhaps noticing the light and shadow as clouds pass across the sun, as well as noticing the change in temperature of your cheek. as clouds pass in front of the sun before revealing the warmth of that sun again.
hearing the distant flapping sound of a bird taking off from the ground. The sound it makes as air pumps through its body and out its mouth while its chest moves as it beats its wings where it makes that noise without wanting to or trying to just because it's pumping air because of the natural movement of its body and its wings to fly to take off hearing the sliding sound and the splashing sound of a bird landing in the lake Hearing the occasional sound of insects buzzing past your ears. And just my moving your head ever so slightly left and right, as if shaking your head no. Being able to notice the direction of sounds. and making a clicking sound with your mouth and being able to notice the way that sound reacts with the environment whether the sound reverberates bounces straight back is absorbed by the environment and the way that sound reacts depending on where in the environment it's bouncing back to you from and letting out a few clicks to begin to get an idea of distances to things whether there's trees that you can hear rustling that are nearer or perhaps further away whether there are shrubs whether there's anything else closer to you or whether you're really looking over a vast vista and the sounds of birds flying overhead the sounds they make as well as the sounds of their wings being able to focus and almost pinpoint each individual bird sound have an idea of how many birds are flying overhead And then when you're ready, beginning to paint. And I don't know whether you'll paint the ground first or the sky first. But beginning to just place some of that paint on the canvas rubbing it onto the canvas using both hands at the same time washing those fingertips rubbing those fingertips dry and then applying more paint perhaps doing the basic colour of the ground first and then a basic colour of the sky and gradually building from no detail to more and more detail as you create your own representation interpretation of your experience 
perhaps just a generic greeny color and blue color. Then maybe having this sense of those trees off to the left. And the type of sound of the leaves and the rubbing branches that you can hear that let you have an idea of how densely packed or loosely packed those trees are, how far away they are. And just painting a representation of the sound and maybe hearing some footsteps and chewing sounds on the grass, off, way off in the distance, and painting your representation of that, of a herd of animals, and working your way round this painting focusing on different elements of your experience and then painting what you would say is your representation of that experience how you would describe something you can only hear and what you discover is that the more you become absorbed in painting in this way, the deeper and deeper into the experience you go, and the deeper and deeper into the experience you go, the more profound you find this experience. And you discover that you almost become one with the experience, as if you can see the world around you, that doesn't look as you know the world looks, but looks as if you're looking at a world, even though your eyes are closed and you're just experiencing that world through different senses that you don't normally pay much attention to the experience of. You know that you can hear the world around you you know that you can feel the world around you. You know that you have a sense of your place in the world around you. But you also know that in everyday life, you don't pay a huge amount of attention to all of that incoming information. that your focus is more just on what you can see if someone said to describe a certain animal. Your first response may be to describe what it looks like unless there is something incredibly distinctive perhaps about what it sounds like. And after a while of painting in this way, you have this sense like you're done with the painting. You wash your fingertips, you open your eyes and you step back. And you're surprised by the painting that you've done. And then you take that canvas from the easel. You place the original canvas back on the easel. And then before you take that canvas off the easel, 
the artist says to step aside. They want to have a sense of what you painted. And out here in the savannah, the paint dries quickly and they run their fingers over that painting, feeling the temperature difference for different colors, the texture difference across the painting. And they praise you on how well you've done at representing the world around you and perceiving the world around you in this new way. And then they say that you can take your artwork and let it remind you of being able to take alternative perspectives on the world. That sometimes things aren't always as they seem. And so you take your canvas, place the other canvas back in place. You say goodbye to that artist. And you head away from this savannah. And as you head away from the savannah, so in your mind, while you're heading home, all you can think about is the experience of painting and having a curiosity to want to explore your painting with your eyes. You'd had a little look at it out in the savannah, but you haven't really explored that painting. And once you arrive home, it's night time, you head indoors. You place that painting up on a side. And you step back and look at that painting. And you think in your mind about the experience, about what you really saw in that location. And you compare what you really saw visually with what you painted, what your representation was of that environment without vision. And then you step up to that painting. You feel across the painting with your fingertips. Having a sense of the feeling of the different colors the temperature difference between those different colors under the light in your room. Allowing yourself to become so deeply absorbed so that you become almost hyper aware of the most subtle changes. And then you step back again and take a look again and smile at how absorbing it was to just touch that painting and allow yourself to become deeply absorbed in the experience again. And you head to bed with a sense of curiosity about how you can perceive the world differently what you can learn from this experience about what other environments might be interesting to paint in this way or even to just stand in or sit in to close your eyes and experience them with your eyes closed to heighten your other senses to heighten your sense of smell, of touch, of taste, of hearing. And what difference that might make to your perception of these locations. 
And while thinking about this, you gently relax. You gently drift and flow to sleep. Falling into the most peaceful, pleasant sleep all night long. So just take a moment to allow your eyes to close and allow yourself to begin to relax. And as you begin to comfortably drift asleep, I'm just going to tell this sleep meditation in the background. And I don't know whether you'll drift asleep faster to the sound of my voice or whether it'll be to the spaces between my words. And as you begin to comfortably drift asleep, you can have a sense of a woman walking through a field of sunflowers at sunset. And many of those sunflowers are as tall as her shoulders. And she's walking through those beautiful yellow flowers. Noticing that orange sky with that sun setting on the horizon. Perhaps noticing the occasional wispy clouds in the sky. Catching the last glimmers of light. And as she walks through this field of sunflowers. So she can feel what each footstep feels like hearing that slight crunch of the mud under her feet, noticing the way that her feet sink slightly into that mud with each step that she takes. She can hear the rustling as her body pushes through the rows of sunflowers. And she can begin to hear the evening sounds set in as that sun continues to dip lower and lower over the horizon. And after a while of walking through that field of sunflowers, so she notices the stars appearing in the sky and the slightest slither of colour on the horizon following behind that setting sun and she walks out of that field and she can feel the beginning coolness of the air as she walks across grass and heads towards a cabin a little way from that field. She can notice the glow of light coming from the cabin windows. She can just about make out the faint sight of smoke at the chimney. She can walk past an old tractor and heads into that cabin, hearing the sound of the door as she opens it, wiping her feet, entering the cabin feeling the warmth in the cabin, noticing the flickering fire of a fire in the fireplace in the living room. And she settles down in a chair near that fireplace and takes a few moments to begin to comfortably relax. And as she begins to comfortably relax, 
She takes a few deep, purposeful breaths and allows her eyes to gently close. And as her eyes gently close, she can feel the air passing in through her nose and out through her mouth. As she breathes calmly and methodically, allowing her mind to wander as she begins the process of relaxing so deeply and so soundly into the experience. And as she listens to the crackling of that fire and the slight sound of the dancing flames as the occasional slight breeze down the chimney disturbs the flame of the fire. She starts to have this sense of the crackling and the sound of the flames dancing being almost like the sound of bubbles rising from scuba gear with each out breath that she takes and the sound of the dancing flames being almost like the sound of waves passing overhead and she begins to form this mental image in her mind's eye of being underwater, floating so peacefully, so calmly scuba diving underwater, with the sound of the bubbles, with each outbreath, a slight tickling of the bubbles on her cheek as they pass beside her face sound of the waves overhead and that feeling of the pressure change as those waves roll past and while she has that feeling of floating in the ocean scuba diving she begins to have that sense of hearing some distant whales calling out to each other, of seeing fish swim by, and of the way that everything seems to move almost in slow motion, so peacefully and so calmly down here. And that something about being underwater seems to encourage her breathing to relax further and deeper. And while her breathing relaxes deeper and deeper, She has that sense of noticing the colourful fish of a coral reef and swimming towards the shore and hearing the increasing sound of the waves as they roll into the shore, as they crash on the shore. And as she approaches the shore, so she reaches a point where the sea is shallow enough for her to walk up onto the shore. And she begins to walk towards that seashore. And as she does, she notices as her head and shoulders and then her body exit the water. How heavy and cumbersome the scuba gear is 
while walking with the weight of the tank on her back, making her have to lean forward to compensate. And once she's nearly fully out of the water, she takes the tank off her back and carries it beside her. And she walks up onto the most beautiful tropical beach, places her tank down on the sand, sits down next to that tank, takes off the face mask and gazes out over the most beautiful sparkling ocean the way the sun glistens and sparkles as it catches the tops of the waves of the rippling water noticing the areas of the beach where the water's rolling in the white horses crashing onto the shore. The areas of the beach where the water's calmer and just seems to almost gently lap onto the shore. And while sitting down here on the sand, she rests her hand down on the sand, feels the warmth of that sand notices the texture of the sand, the sensations of that dry sand under her hand, and grasps the scoop of that sand, feeling what it's like for that sand to flow through the palm of her hand, through her fingertips, catching in the breeze, and blowing away from her in the breeze and how some of that sand just beneath the surface is so cool and refreshing and she rests back places her tank behind her head rests her head on the tank and just watches for a while feeling the breeze on her face watching those clouds pass overhead so wispy and infrequently and just enjoying being in the moment she can hear the rustling of the wind blowing through the trees on this island behind her, hearing the sounds of birds among the trees, notice some birds flying overhead, and gazing out to sea she can see the occasional bird dive into the ocean before rising out of the water again and see other birds come down and land on the ocean and just bobbing up and down in little groups of birds on the ocean as the waves seem to pass from behind those birds straight under those birds as they just rise up as the wave passes by and then lower down again keeping just far enough out to see so that the wave passes under them almost unnoticeable before curling over as it approaches the shore and bubbling its way along the shore and as she rests there just watching the environment, just watching those birds on the ocean, watching the clouds pass overhead, feeling the cool breeze 
in the warmth of the sun. She allows her eyes to close. She turns her head towards the sun and begins to have that feeling almost like the sun is channeling energy inside her, feeling the warmth of that sun on her face. Noticing the slight orangey glow behind her eyelids. While listening to those rustling trees. And as she rests there listening and drifting into the moment. She begins to channel her attention around the different aspects of her experience to really narrow her experience down to being just in the moment. And after a while, she starts to have the strangest experience, almost like Everything was grinding to a halt. And as she carefully and slowly allows her eyes to open, she notices that time seems to have stood still. But it's almost like she's so in the moment that for her, time is standing still that time is still passing internally for her. As she looks around, she's able to think, she's able to move, but externally from her, it's as if time stood still. And she stands up, notices time still seems to be stationary. She can see stationary birds mid-flight. A stationary bird mid-dive into the sea. She can notice stationary waves about to break on the shore. And she's curious about this experience that she's having. And then she sees as she looks around a little way down the beach. Seems to be a little shelter made with wood and leaves. And she walks down towards that shelter. And she sees what looks like a person sitting in that shelter. And they don't seem to be moving, so she assumes that they are also stationary. But as she gets nearer to them, they look over towards her. And for just a moment, she's taken aback because she thought that Everything was stationary except for her. And they say to her that time has stood still. And that time has stood still where only the two of them are able to notice. That they saw the way she seemed to be drifting in her mind. Drifting into the moment. And as they saw this woman down the beach drifting into the moment, they were curious to enjoy the experience with them. And so they matched the breathing of that woman down the beach. They matched the body language of the woman down the beach. 
and they allowed themselves to be drawn into the same reality as the woman down the beach and have noticed that now the two of them are almost existing outside of time and the woman sits down with this person near their campfire only the campfire is stationary and there appears to be no heat given off by this campfire and they explain that while everything is stationary there's no way for heat to transfer and the woman's surprised that they can hear each other and they explain that hearing isn't just about the sounds that perhaps something about being in this state of mind triggers that ability to take all of the information and create the sound of speech where there perhaps is none in the same way that you can look at a moving image of something heavy thudding on the ground and despite there being no sound attached to that moving image your brain can fill in the blanks and make you feel like you're hearing that thudding sound that isn't there and that if you're capable of stopping time then your brain is probably more capable than just making a thudding sound happen where there isn't one and the woman felt that this sounded plausible And she asked this person questions and they responded with some answers. And they generally spoke about the nature of reality, of time, of space, of consciousness, of perception. And after a while, the woman felt that it would be time to go back to the other point on the beach and that she just had this feeling like the experience should begin to come to an end and so she headed back along the beach rested back down where she was and then in a moment she suddenly heard this massive splash as a wave crashed on the shore and a bird completed its dive and the sounds of birds circling overhead could be heard the rustling sound of the trees and as she continued to just enjoy the experience a little longer Resting on this beach, gazing at the way the sun sparkled on the water, the sounds of the sea rolling in and rolling out, sounds of rustling leaves of the trees behind her, the sounds of the environment, sounds of nature, the feeling of the sand beneath her, the smell of that salty air. She took time to really, honestly and fully enjoy this experience. Before she started to 
have a sense of the sound of a crackling fire. And off in the distance, she started to see her experience fading, the sky turning darker, almost to a non-existent darkness that gradually got closer and closer until she found herself just aware of resting there near that fire, the warmth of the fire on her cheeks, resting and relaxing near that fire, the feeling of the chair under her arm against her back, her bum and her legs, her feet on the floor, and the warmth of that fire on her cheeks. And almost like a slight glow through her eyelids, as she allowed her eyes to open, and she could notice looking out of the windows, night time had fully set in, she could notice the way the fire was now just embers, and had really calmed down in the fireplace. And she put out the last of that fire before heading to bed. And as she rested down in bed, she had the window very slightly open just to allow a little bit of air in and she could feel the coolness of that air as she breathed that in and out coolness on her cheeks, could hear the sounds of nature outside, the nighttime sounds. And notice the moonlight as the moon passed across the sky and the moonlight began to shine into her window. And feeling the warmth of being in the bed, the comfort of being in the bed. The softness of the mattress, of the pillows. and the coolness of the other side of the pillow and she flipped it over. The coolness of that pillow against her cheek as she allowed herself to give in to the process of drifting and floating so peacefully, so calmly, so comfortably asleep knowing that she can awaken in the morning, having had the most incredible night's sleep, to go back outside, to explore the surroundings, to smell the flowers, to walk through the sunflowers, to enjoy feeling so fully alert and awake, from having such a wonderful and relaxed night's sleep. And so with a sense of peace, of comfort, of deep relaxation, she drifts and floats asleep. Okay, so 
just take a moment to allow your eyes to close and allow yourself to begin to relax. And as you begin to comfortably relax, I'm just going to tell this sleep meditation in the background. And this is a sleep meditation about a young girl. And one day, this young girl is out walking in the countryside. And she lives on a farm. And she's walking across the countryside, heading back towards the farm. And as she walks, so she can hear the sounds of birds in the trees. She can hear the sounds of some birds overhead. She can see a circling bird of prey over the field occasionally lowering down, hovering, before flying higher in the sky and continuing to circle. And she continues her walk through the countryside back towards her farm. And as she walks, hearing the sound of the rustling leaves of the trees, in the woodland behind her, seeing the way the grass sways across the fields as the wind blows a breeze, feeling that breeze on her cheeks, the movement of her clothes. She really enjoys the peace of the day. And she follows a path through this countryside, over some undulating hills. And the sun is beginning to get lower on the horizon, just a few hours from setting. And near the gate to the farmland, she sees this man sat on a post. And this man's playing some kind of a stringed musical instrument, just gently plucking away at that musical instrument, as if plucking the instrument in time with the sounds of nature. And as she walks past that man with a sense of familiarity and curiosity for him, he looks up towards her and he says that he's got something for her, that he's been sat here waiting for her to walk by and that he didn't know that he was waiting for her specifically until he saw her approaching. And he hands her a small bag of pebbles, like a little pouch of pebbles. And he tells her that as she walks back to her farm, she's to go and walk into the barn and while she walks into the barn, she's to take those pebbles with her. And every ten steps from that barn back towards her home, she's to drop a pebble behind her. And she's confused by this but takes the pebbles and heads into the farmland. And off in the distance, she can see the top of the barn and she walks towards the barn. And as she arrives at the barn, so the sun is beginning to set the shadows are stretching across the ground. 
birds are quietening down. She walks into that barn, turns around, and as she walks back out of the barn, she follows those instructions. Every ten steps, she takes one of the pebbles, drops it down behind her, continues walking. Ten steps later, she drops another pebble. Ten steps later, she drops another pebble. Ten steps later, she drops another pebble. And as she walks methodically, dropping those pebbles behind her as she goes. So she feels this sense of peace, of calmness, a sense of inner serenity, almost a connection to the world around her, as the sun is almost fully set over the horizon and she's almost at her home. And as she arrives home, so she finds that she's dropping the last pebble from that pouch. And she's curious how there were exactly the right number of pebbles to drop between the barn and her home. And she enters into her home, relaxes down at home. She has something to eat, reads a book for the evening, and then heads to bed. And as she drifts comfortably asleep, so she begins to dream about waking up getting out of bed, walking downstairs in a quiet house, walking out the back of the house, into the conservatory at the back of the house, gazing out over the dark garden, seeing those stars twinkling overhead. Noticing some fireflies darting among the trees at the end of the garden. And then having this sense almost like those fireflies have somehow noticed her. And frozen in space as if to not be seen. But as she remains motionless gazing out over the garden. After a few moments, they go back to flying like normal. And then, out of the darkness in the garden, she notices a shadow that, as it gets closer, begins to become more observable that as it gets closer she notices is a white unicorn and it comes out of the darkness as a shadowy figure and then clearly a unicorn approaching the house and it comes up to the conservatory doors it lowers its head And hanging on its horn, she can see a necklace. And so she opens the conservatory door, takes that necklace off of the unicorn's horn. The unicorn then raises its head. And as it raises its head, so she feels its breathing, its warm breath 
on her body. As she stood near its head, with its head slightly higher than her shoulder, And she takes a step back into the conservatory, closes the door, watches as that unicorn turns, heads back into the darkness and disappears. She then has this sense of heading back to bed. And the next morning she awakens, gets out of bed, gets some clothes on, heads down, stairs, for breakfast. And as she arrives for breakfast, and is eating her breakfast, her mum asks her where she got the necklace. And it's only at this point that she realises she has that necklace from her dream hanging around her neck. And she says that she found it, but doesn't know any other way to explain. And after breakfast, she heads out of the house and notices the strangest thing that following those pebbles between the home and the barn seems to be a purple force field or a purple light stretching from the ground up high into the sky. And she tries to walk across that purple light, reaching out to touch the purple light and finds that it feels like a smooth barrier. And she can't walk around that purple barrier. The purple barrier goes all the way to her front door. And so she heads in to the home again. And she tries to go out the back door and then walk around. And as she walks around the house, she finds that she's on the other side of the barrier. Only on this side of the barrier, there's something unusual about this land. She can see flying overhead a dragon. that just seems to be flying through the sky and then disappearing off into the distance. She can see that purple barrier. She can walk up to it. She can touch it and it has that same soft, smooth feeling. And she can see that the other side of the barrier the other side of this purple force field looks normal, exactly as she remembered it from moments ago when she was around there. Whereas this side, it's almost like she's in a different place. And she wonders how the two lands are separated that she can tell the lands are separated by this purple barrier. But she was able to walk around the barrier. So she followed her way round the garden, heading round the back of the garden, to see if there's a point between one land and the other, to see if she could walk right around the outside of the house, around the outside of that garden, all the way round to the other side of the barrier, without ever going inside. But 
but she finds as she arrives at the barrier that she's still in that strange land. And she heads back round in through the back garden, in through the back of the house, walks through the house, comes out the front door and finds that she's in her normal world and can see looking through that purple barrier that that over there looks like that strange land and she decides to repeat her experiment. She walks from this side of the purple barrier, around the outside of the house, around the outside of the garden, all the way round to the other side of the purple barrier, and on arrival on the other side of the purple barrier, she finds that She's still in her normal land. There's no dragons here. There's nothing unusual here. That something about walking out the front door and being on one side of that barrier versus walking out the back door makes it so that you discover one land or the other. And she was curious about this land and curious about why this purple barrier is here. The purple barrier seems to follow the path of pebbles that she laid the night before from the barn all the way to the front door. And so she walked out the front door, walked along the edge of that purple barrier, all the way to the barn. And at the barn, she walked around the barn and found that as she walked around the barn, so she was still in her normal land just the other side of the purple barrier. And so she walked back around the barn again and walked through the barn. And as she walked through the barn and then opened a small exit at the back of the barn, she noticed that exit opened to this strange land where she could see that dragon flying overhead. And she wondered what was going on, wondered whether this was even real. And she was surprised at how quiet the land appeared. There didn't seem to be any sounds of birds singing. The air seemed incredibly still. She could see a unicorn grazing off in the distance, wondered whether it was the same unicorn from her dream the night before and whether it was even a dream, or whether perhaps she'd woken during the night, gone downstairs, gone out the back door into this unusual land, and then just interpreted it as a dream. And then she could see that person that she saw the day before, sitting on a post on the edge of the field in this unusual land. And so she walked over to that person and they told her that there was something of a wizard 
something of a fortune teller. And that they traverse the realms between one reality and another. And she had taken those pebbles and laid the right number of pebbles down to allow a barrier to form where both realities, where two of these realms, could coexist side by side. with gateways between the realms, where the barrier forms a gateway at both ends, and passing through those gateways, you come out in one realm or the other, and that her help was needed, that she's small and capable of being able to travel into places that he can't go. And he wasn't sure whether she would help. So he wanted to see if she would follow some instructions and be willing to engage. And he gave her those pebbles, and she laid down those pebbles. He then wanted to see if her curiosity would lead to her being willing to explore the unknown. Whether her mindset would enable her to try to work things out, try to work out what's going on, and solve puzzles. And she had done all of these things. She'd laid the pebbles. She had explored this alternative reality. She had visited the reality despite seeing a dragon and revisited that reality. And so he's now confident that she would voluntarily engage in a quest through this land. And this wizard jumped down off that post and walked down a path and the girl followed down that path. And the wizard explained while they were walking about this land, about it being almost a mythical land by normal land standards that here you can find giants dragons fairies unicorns all sorts of creatures others would see as mythical but there's one thing that the wizard needs help with. That a spaceship had crashed in this realm. And the way the spaceship had crashed was from the future into the past. And the only way to be able to change that future
is to change the past, to enable that spaceship to avoid crashing, and the girl didn't really understand, but the wizard said that this crash happened a long time in the future and an even longer time in the past, and so the wreckage of the crash is deeply buried, and there's a path to the wreckage, but they are too big to traverse it. They have specific powers and abilities, but as with all wizards, they can't use those powers on themselves. And in this land, there are no humans. There are many mythical creatures but any creature which is inherently magic can't be influenced by the magic of others. And so they've been unable to get anyone to be able to go to that wreckage, to be able to change the course of the future that in changing that course, would allow an improved connection between these two realms. There are crossover points through time and space, but at some point in the future, one of those crossover points opens up in space just as a spaceship is passing over and that spaceship passed through that crossover point and as it came in towards the earth it ended up not picking up any of its usual signals, not picking up signals to guide it safely to the planet, because it was approaching the planet in a different realm and thousands of years in the past. And so it crashed and has lay there crashed until now when the wizard has met this young girl and knows that she may be the one to be able to help. That over those thousands of years, they've been waiting for someone who could help. And the girl heads with that wizard to the location of that crashed spaceship. And on arrival at that crashed spaceship, the girl looks around and the land appears fairly normal, apart from what almost looks like a small rabbit hole leading down into the ground. And this wizard says that they can shrink the girl down so that she can enter that hole. And they can make it so that she'll grow back to being her normal size once she's in the hole 
but when she grows back to being normal size, she can do so by saying a secret word to herself that will not only bring her back to her normal size, but it will give her what she will perceive almost as superpowers. And that as she's down there with those superpowers, so she'll be able to turn back time. And as she turns back time, so she'll be able to turn back time for that ship. And she'll be able to guide that ship back into space. By turning back time while watching as that ship reverses from the ground back up into the sky back out into space, back through that rift. And he teaches her a specific word, which he says will seal the rift. That these rifts spontaneously occur, and normally spontaneously occur on Earth. But for some reason that one had occurred in space just for a few moments, but at the wrong time. And that if she can send that spaceship back through that rift, say that word, she'll watch as that rift seals up. And then, in the spaceship's own time, as soon as that rift is sealed, time for those in the spaceship will travel forwards again, as if nothing has happened from that moment forward. And the spaceship will pass right past where the rift would have been, perfectly fine and safe all saved without even knowing that they had been saved, because the bit of their future that had happened in the past won't have happened. And so the girl gets taught those words, and she heads down through that hole walking deeper and deeper underground. Looking around her, intrigued by the sight of the inside of what almost looks like a rabbit hole. But to her, it's like walking through a large cave as she has shrunk down to the size of a mouse. And after some walking, going deeper and deeper underground, she comes out in a large chamber where she can see that crashed spacecraft. And she reverses time as she changes back to her normal size. And as she reverses time, so the mud level shrinks down around her, suddenly finding herself thousands of years in the past, with this land looking as it did back then. And that spacecraft rises from the ground, reverses back up into the sky, flies backwards around the planet into space. She sees it as it heads backwards approaching that rift in space. 
and watches as it passes backwards through that rift. She then says the magic word, watches as that rift closes. And then to her it's as if she's just there in this world seeing the environment as time moves forward again but nothing is happening that rift doesn't reappear she can see different creatures around her but everything moves forward without that rift reopening She then says a word that changes time and notices as time starts to move forward. Only this time, the ground isn't building up around a spaceship. The ground is just gradually building up. So as time moves forward, so she has to climb up onto the land as it's beginning to grow around her. Until eventually she sees that wizard approaching and walking over to this spot. And time slows down, goes back to normal, and ticks along at normal speed. And this wizard says, you seem to look familiar. I had this sense that I should be here for some reason. But I don't really know why. I had this sense that I needed to meet you, but I don't recognize you or know who you are. And the girl who stood there wearing that necklace, looking back at that wizard, curious at how they don't seem to know or recognize her. And the wizard says that they felt some kind of a connection. That there was something about that necklace that they were thinking of. They just felt they were supposed to meet the girl wearing that necklace in this location at this exact time. And that they had grown up being told that's what they were to do. With no knowledge of why. And the girl realized that somehow a connection had been created that this wizard must have created in that alternate reality where that spaceship was still crashed there that this wizard must have created before sending her down that hole to change the reality that somehow connected perhaps the old reality with this new reality via this necklace that this wizard had no reason to be here or to call upon this girl for help when there was no spacecraft crashed here. But the reason there's no spacecraft crashed here is because this wizard had called upon this girl for help. And so there was a catch-22 situation. By calling on the girl for help, they resolve the spacecraft issue 
by resolving the spacecraft issue. There's no issue to have grown up needing help with to call upon that girl. So they don't call upon the girl for help, so there's a spacecraft issue which needs the girl to help. And that to resolve this paradox, the wizard must have done something to connect one reality with the other, perhaps using this necklace. Almost like a bridge between the old and the new. And so in this new reality, they grew up with no memory of what had happened, yet the girl had memories of what she had done. For her it was one continuous experience, from her house to this land, down that hole, changing time, changing time back, and being back here was all one long continuous experience. And so she was able to have a sense of her reality as it had been experienced, which was different to the real reality as others had experienced. And she didn't know where in the future that spacecraft had come from. She was confident that it had come from some time after her own time, because she's sure she would have heard of it if a spacecraft had gone missing. And the wizard was curious to hear her story, had been curious for many years about this story passed down through the wizard's family generations, passing down this one message about being here at this time to meet this girl in a necklace. about having to give this girl some pebbles and somehow the whole thing had worked out. And one thing that the girl had noticed as this wizard gave her some pebbles, which she thought to herself, you've given me some like that before, was that that purple barrier was no longer there. That in this reality, the wizard hadn't previously given her pebbles. That her house wasn't there, the barn wasn't there. She was just here in this mythical land. And the wizard gave the girl those pebbles and told her a location to walk to and told her to place them every 10 steps, just drop one every 10 steps as you walk from that location to this other location that was marked on the ground. And the wizard didn't know or understand why or what any of that meant. That they knew that they could travel between one reality and another. And they knew that the locations were between what was the edge of the barn and the front door of a building. And the girl went and walked along and dropped those pebbles as she walked. 
but as with before, as she could remember. Nothing happens just because there are pebbles there. She had to sleep on it. And it was the next day when there was that purple force field, that purple barrier between the realms, that she was able to walk around and head from one realm to the other. And she didn't know how long that purple barrier lasted. Did it last a day, a week, a month? Was it always there, once placed there? She wondered whether she was the only one that could see it, or whether, when her parents leave home, walking out the front door, do they see this purple barrier as well? She was curious she hadn't considered that or thought about that previously. But she was aware that the barrier most likely wouldn't appear until nightfall, and she wondered whether her parents would wonder where she was. And the wizard said that they can turn back time for her. They can turn back time to the day before, so that the stones that she's placed are placed essentially the night before, as she had placed them before. And so that's what the wizard did. They turned back time. So this way, she'd be laying those pebbles the day before. And then overnight, she would be in her normal reality. Going to bed, her parents knowing where she is. While in this reality, she is here. And then in the morning, that barrier would appear. And in the normal reality, that's when she would explore and travel across from one reality to the other. And in this reality, she can travel back across to the other reality so that to her parents it'll be as if she's just nipped outside and no time has elapsed and yet to her she spent a day here and so time is turned back those pebbles are laid And then she goes and sits near a campfire, near a lake and waterfall in this land. And while sitting there as the sun sets here in this land, she can hear the sound of twinkling and sparkling and sees something rising from around the base of the waterfall that's pouring into the lake. And the wizard says, that's just the waterfall fairies. They wake up as the sun sets. They leave the water and they fly and do their errands at night, lighting their own way as they go. And she watches as they dart around, almost looking like fireflies in the distance. And then she sees a unicorn coming over towards them out of the darkness. And as that unicorn nears them, the wizard calls it over. He takes a necklace from the inside of his cloak. 
He hangs that necklace on the horn of the unicorn. The girl recognizes and touches the necklace around her neck, realizing they're the same necklace. The wizard says, go and give this to the girl. And that unicorn heads off. And seems to fade into the darkness. She recognizes that, that unicorn is going to be arriving at the back of her house. And that it wasn't a dream. She must have woken during the night for some reason and headed downstairs and out to where that unicorn was. And the wizard and the girl sit by a campfire that's crackling away, the light dancing, feeling the warmth of this environment and she drifts and floats asleep for the night while that wizard just seems to sit there cross-legged gazing at the fire and the next morning she awakens sees the fire has burned down to embers she heads away from the lake she heads back towards where her home should be. She sees that purple barrier. She walks down to the end of the purple barrier, finds the way through into the back of the barn, heads through the back of that barn, out the front of the barn, and she sees herself over there coming out of the front door. And she ducks down and hides. And keeps just out of view as she watches herself explore the barrier. Watches herself head back to the home. Waits and waits and then sees herself eventually coming around the side of the building. Sees herself heading to the barn. Watches as she walks through the barn. And knows that she's going to be heading through the barn. And having the adventure she's just been on. And after she has passed through that barn. The girl comes out from hiding, walks back to her house. Her mum says, oh, you weren't gone long. As the girl says, she just wants to go and lie down for a little bit. She's quite tired already. And she heads up to bed. And she lies on her bed just for a little while to rest her eyes. She drifts asleep for a short while, has a few hours of a nap, before waking and heading down and outside. But when she heads down and outside, so she notices that that barrier has disappeared. She notices that the stones have disappeared. And she realizes that the realities must have shifted. That now must be the time when she's headed down, changed history, changed the past and the future, which has changed the present. meaning that she was never given those stones. 
and so by not laying those pebbles there was no barrier. And she finds this a curious experience and wonders whether there's ever a point in the future where she's going to be able to see that mythical realm again. And as she turns to head into the front door again, she sees a rock by the front door. And it looks curious and placed on purpose. She picks up that rock, and underneath the rock, she sees a note that just says, Thank you. We'll meet again. She places that rock down and heads back into the home. She relaxes, reads a book, enjoys her day. And at the end of the day, she heads to bed, thinking about the experience she's had over what to her it was about two days. And while thinking about that, and curious about what else might be in that alternative realm, she drifts and floats so peacefully, so comfortably, asleep all night long. Okay, so just take a moment to allow your eyes to close and allow yourself to begin to relax. And as you begin to relax, I don't know whether you'll relax deeper to the sound of my voice or whether it'll be to the spaces between my words. And while you begin to comfortably relax, I'm just going to tell this sleep meditation in the background. And it's a sleep meditation about a medieval man and this medieval man is living on the edge of a river and they live in a small round property that they built themselves many years earlier and one day they have a dream that sends them on a quest and they wake up that morning feeling a deep sense of purpose. And this dream tells them that they have to head north. And they don't normally head north. They normally spend their time near the river, perhaps sometimes following the river down to the coast. But they rarely go that far north. When they look north off in the distance, they can see mountains. And they often have this sense that they can see the sky so much darker in that direction. Almost like the mountains constantly churn up clouds. And so they prepare themselves for their journey. They pick up what they call their haggis sack, which they sling over a shoulder and they have it hanging down beside them. Inside that sack, they place an object that they've been told in their dream to take north. And then they begin to follow that river, heading northward. And as they set off, they depart the others in this area. And at first the terrain is familiar 
the sound of that river flowing down beside them, the sounds of birds, clouds overhead, the rustling sounds of leaves in the trees, the gentle thud of each footstep on the grass as they go. And they continue to walk as the sun continues to rise and travel across the sky. And they keep that sun behind them and they watch as their shadow moves from one side to the other as they continue to walk. And after many hours of walking, they notice that their shadow has moved to a point that lets them know that about half of the day has gone. And they're still following this river. And they're pretty much at the limit of how far in this direction they've ever walked before. And they stop beside the river. And they take a break. They sit down next to the water's edge. They rest their feet in the water. And they allow their feet to be relaxed and soothed by the bubbling, flowing water. As that cool water flows around their feet, through their toes, around their ankles. Bubbling and trickling as it goes. And they sit there, just relaxing. And while relaxing, they have a blade which they use to cut off layers of wood almost into wooden shaving. And while they're doing that, carving a few arrows, they decide to carve something else. So they take a bit of wood, and just as they're relaxing there, they begin to carve that bit of wood into a shape that will be more stable on the water. And they carve out a hollowing in the top of that boat. And they place some of the shavings into the hollowing. And then they create a mask using some narrow bits of bark, almost like string, using some leaves for the sails. And then they make a small fire. And they use that small fire to light those shavings in the boat. And they hold that boat in both hands, close their eyes, and feel and smell that smoke blowing up from the fire towards their face. As they say a prayer and almost make a 
gesture or an offering for good luck on this journey. And after sincerely making that gesture, they open their eyes, they lean forward, they gently holding that boat with two hands cupped around it, lower that boat into the water, and then release their hands, watch as that boat bobs slightly, sways slightly, as it settles onto the water, before it then gets taken by that river and follows the current downstream. Following the current back down in the direction they've traveled from. And they sit back and they watch that boat as it slowly travels downstream. Watching the smoking from inside that boat of those shavings. Aware that the dampness of the leaves used for sails will prevent them from easily catching light as they watch that offering float away. And then after their brief break, they continue their journey. And they stand up. They carry on following this river. And all they've got for company is their own thoughts. And they continue to follow this river until eventually the river starts to narrow and calm and then comes out in a small lake and at the top of this lake there's an area where as they look, they can notice some bubbles just rising up to the surface. And they realize that this is where the river begins. This river that helps sustain their home starts here in this bubbling area. And they grab themselves some water to drink. They fill a container that's hung around them. They've got some water to take with them. They notice that there isn't that long now until the sun begins to set. And so they decide that now would be a good time to find somewhere to settle down. And as they look around the area, they notice a little way from the water's edge where the grass is longer, almost up to their knees, are the occasional trees, and they notice the most beautiful weeping willow tree. And so they duck down 
and head towards the center of that weeping willow tree. And can see the clear space inside that tree, underneath the branches. And they lay down grass that they pull up to make something comfortable to lay on. Then they relax back on that grass, initially just resting against the trunk of the tree. They can hear the wind outside the tree, rustling the leaves of this weeping willow tree. But the weeping willow tree breaks up that wind, meaning that it's relatively calm and still here at the base of the tree. And this specific weeping willow tree hangs all the way down to the ground. And with the tall grass around this area, it shelters from most of the elements, creating an ideal temporary shelter without having to actually make a shelter. And they rest here, sitting against the trunk of the tree. They have something to eat. Before then, settling down onto their grass bed and drifting so peacefully, so comfortably asleep. And as they drift so peacefully and comfortably asleep, they can hear the sounds around them of the evening birds and of other night animals as the night grows deeper and deeper. And the next morning, after a wonderful night's sleep under the willow tree, They leave from under the tree. They have something to eat again. They grab some more water before continuing their journey away from that river, away from that lake, heading towards those mountains. And halfway through the day, they find they've probably made it halfway to the mountains. And that they'll probably reach the mountains just as the sun begins to set. And on reaching the mountains, they begin to climb. And as they climb, they notice something curious they've never seen before. That the sun will begin to set. And they'll climb quite quickly. But when they then turn and look behind them, they see that it's as if the sun is about to set again and they can watch 
for a few moments as that sun begins to set again. But then when they climb a bit higher and they turn and look, it's as if the sun is about to set again. Almost like climbing is resetting part of the day. And they don't really understand what's going on. But find it a curious experience. And they can see high up in these mountains looks like a cave. So they continue climbing higher and higher up this side of this mountain heading up towards that cave, thinking that cave would be a good place to stop, to rest, and to settle down for a while. And they don't know exactly how far they have to go. They just have this drive that they're supposed to head north, and that they'll know when they arrive. And once they reach that cave, they head into the cave, they light a torch, they place that a little way down in the cave, they can hear the wind blowing and echoing into that cave the flickering of that flame as that wind blows past. They relax down. They can feel the coolness up here. They can see over the land. See off in the direction that they came from. They can see the way the river off in the distance stands out, being illuminated, reflecting that sun's light. And as the sun sets, so they can notice the moon rising, the stars appearing in the sky, the Milky Way arched across the sky. The way the stars twinkle, the stillness that sets into the air. And they drift and float so peacefully, so comfortably asleep. And the next morning they're awoken by the morning sun as it shines into the cave and they make themselves something to eat and then they notice that the way the wind is blowing through the cave makes them think that maybe there's a way through the cave rather than having to climb all the way to the top of these mountains and down the other side, perhaps they can cut through. So they decide that they'll explore in the cave, and that at worst, if there's no way of cutting through, they can just walk straight back out the cave and carry on climbing up and over. But it's worthwhile exploring deeper in the cave. And so they head deeper into the cave. And deep in this cave, they notice that there seems to be a breeze coming up from a point in the floor. And as they brush that point on the floor, brushing the mud aside, they can feel that breeze even more. 
and they realize that it's as if there's a trap door or some kind of entrance here. And they move that and they see some steps heading down in this cave. As they descend those spiral steps, on step 20, 19, 18, 17, 16, going deeper and deeper under the cave, 15, 14, 13, 12, 11, 10, 9, Eight, as the cave gets quieter and quieter. Seven, six, five, four, three, two, one, finding themselves stood at the base of a new tunnel. And they head away from that spiral staircase. And they can see that off in the distance looks like a little bit of light. And they head towards the light. And when they reach that light, they find that it's an exit from the cave on the other side of this mountain. And that on this side there seems to be steps heading down the mountain in a zigzag pattern, making the route easier to head down this side than it was to climb up the other side. And they start to wonder whether they're following in the footsteps of someone else who perhaps had found that natural cave and then dug their way down and laid this path to make it easier on this side. And they head down those steps. And the mountains are blocking a lot of the sun and so as they descend this area is very shaded and cool. And at the top, it's very cloudy. And they descend through the clouds, unsure what the view is beyond. But once they get beneath those clouds, they have the most incredible view of what looks almost like the tops of a large forest. They continue to descend and notice that it's raining on this side. And they head into that forest. And as they pass through the forest, initially so dense that very little of that rain seems to find its way to landing on their head. They can hear the rain on the leaves above them. They can hear that pulsing. Sometimes that rain falls very heavy. And then that almost twinkling sound of the rain falling light and moments of no sound, just the rustling sound of leaves, as that rain calms. And at those points, they also notice the increase in sounds of nature, of birds singing. And as they near the clearing, They decide to make an umbrella out of some of the large leaves near the floor of this forest. They take those leaves, they 
stretch them across some wood and make something they can carry above their head to keep them a bit drier while they walk. And they walk away from that forest until they find the edge of a river. And this river seems to be heading away from the mountains as if perhaps it had started in the mountains maybe the water runs off the mountains flows down and has formed this river and they feel that it'll take them a while to travel where they're going on foot So they chop down a tree. They then decide that their use of time is better spent, dedicated to carving that tree out into a canoe. So they carve that tree, hollowing out a space for them to sit in, for their bag, for their water, for anything else they wish to carry with them. They carve and shape some wood as a paddle, and then drag their canoe to the edge of the water, hoping that it'll float fine. They drag it into the water. It dips below the water before popping up above the water. And they find that it doesn't seem as stable as they would like. So before they have the whole thing in the water, they have it with its back resting just on the shore to keep it steady and stable. While they carve a groove near the front, near the back. They then place two carved branches in those grooves. They use some vines to strap those branches in place, crossing those vines over and over and over again and strapping them tightly in place. And then with a thick branch, they place grooves on that branch. They do the same with that on the other end of those branches. And then they push the boat back fully into the water and find that having that stabilizing branch off to the side helps to keep this boat steady as they now begin to canoe down this river following the current. They know the general direction they're heading. And they continue to head in that northerly direction. They don't know how far they have to go just that they feel this drive to head this direction and that they'll know when they get there. And that night they pull that canoe ashore. They make a camp, campfire, 
they rest by the side of that fire. They have themselves some food. They feel the warmth of that fire. They enjoy the sounds around them, the calmness and stillness to the environment. Before drifting and floating asleep, and the next day they continue their journey. And they continue until the river opens out into a lake. And once they arrive at that lake, they pull that boat up onto the shore, continue the journey on foot, heading into some more woodland. before coming out the other side of the woodland in a clearing. And as they come out in this clearing, they see a mound, like a man-made hill. And on that mound they can see a circle of stones. And around the outside of that circle of stones is a circle of small stones. And in the centre is what looks like a shrine. And they have this feeling like this is what they were heading for. It's directly on their path. And as they get nearer and nearer, they feel that sense stronger and stronger. And as they walk up to that shrine, an elderly man with a cane hobbles around the shrine towards them. And they notice that this elderly man appears to be blind. And the elderly man says that you've traveled a long way to be here. You received the message, and you've got something for the shrine. And the man's unsure how this elderly man could know that, but doesn't even question it, just assumes that somehow they would know. And they take that as a sign that they're definitely in the right place. And this elderly man holds out their hand. And the man reaches into his bag. He pulls out what looks like a smooth egg-shaped stone. He places that smooth, egg-shaped stone into the elderly man's hand. The elderly man turns and walks to the shrine, places that stone into a gap in the shrine. And the gap is surrounded by symbols 
and then a purple glow gets given off by that stone and from the symbols. And the man backs away a little as the whole shrine and the stones surrounding the shrine begin to glow purple. And then a low purple fog begins to form from the stones, from the shrine. Falling down this mound, a slight rumble begins to set in. The blind man backs their way, carefully with their walking stick, away from the shrine. And the rumbling increases and the stones start to vibrate. And then the purple light gets brighter and brighter and spreads away from those stones. Then it begins to circle around that man and continues to spread wider and wider. And the man backs away further and further and can see that the elderly man is within the light can see shapes and shadows forming in the light. And then as that light begins to dim down and calm, as the vibrating calms down and the purple fog dissipates, the man's surprised to see a dragon next to that shrine and resting his hand on the dragon's nose is a healthy, fit looking young man. And that man then turns smiling, heads over to the other man and thanks them for what they've done and tells them that their dragon had been captured, transported out of the realm to another realm and that they live for thousands of years watching over the land a dragon and a rider. And as a rider, they age, they get older and older and older. But they don't die. So they just get older and older and more and more frail. When they're separated from their dragon. Yet, when they're together, they both remain young to protect the realm, to protect the land. And that together, they're here protecting this land and can now do so again. That when someone reaches a certain age and a new rider needs to be found, A dragon will choose the rider and together they'll protect the land without either aging and that now they are back. They can protect the land against evil. And the man says they've never really noticed much evil. And they're told that that's because of the riders and the dragons. 
that there's been an evil wizard who had separated them, who had removed his power by trapping the dragon in a different realm from him, and that that wizard has spent hundreds of years plotting, undermining, influencing from the background. and that now they can fight off this evil. And that man and the dragon took off and flew away out of sight. And the other man felt that This was a curious experience to have. That he had just taken a stone he had found one day that he thought was curious that washed up on the shore near where he lived. He felt this compelling feeling to travel north. And now with nothing to show for his journey, he has to head home. And so he follows his path back home. Finds his way back to the mountains. Heads through the mountains. Heads down the other side and begins to follow that river back to his home. And as he does, he gazes up in the sky and he sees a comet. And the next night, that comet with its tails is still passing across the sky. And he feels this sense that that comet is a sign to say thank you for his help. That there's a battle going on somewhere against evil. And he's done his bit to help in that battle. And he's curious how that presents itself and what's going on and what the outcome will be. And why he's lived all this time never knowing about this. And as he arrives back home, he's pleased to see his home. He's pleased to be back at his own bed. He settles down that night and gently drifts and floats and falls asleep, sleeping so well all night long knowing he'll awaken, feeling refreshed, revitalized and great in the morning. Falling asleep, thinking about and dreaming about his adventure, curious whether it'll see that man and the dragon again. And curious about the adventures of that man and the dragon as he drifts and floats deeply and comfortably asleep. So just take a minute to allow your eyes to close and allow yourself to begin to relax. And as you begin to relax, I don't know whether you'll drift asleep faster to the sound of my voice or whether it'll be to the spaces between my words. And as you begin to comfortably drift asleep, I'm just going to tell you this sleep meditation in the background. It's a sleep meditation about a man heading on a long road trip to the coast. And they're traveling in their car on this long road trip. 
and they're finding the experience difficult to remain alert as there's so little going on around them and they haven't seen another car for many many hours and around them is just flat land and off in the distance in one direction and mountains so far in the distance you can just see the peaks and looking down this straight road it just seems to go all the way to the horizon and then just disappears as if it could go on forever and ever and they continue traveling along this road heading towards the coast as the sun travels across the sky they notice the way the sky changes color as their journey continues with the beginning of the day having the sky in shades of oranges and reds and pinks and as the day continues on so a blueness sets across the sky getting richer and richer with barely a cloud in the sky and then as the day begins to draw to an end so they can notice those reds and oranges creeping back into the sky again before noticing stars appearing in the sky and an inky blackness setting into that sky and they drive for a while with that inky black sky the twinkling stars overhead unable to see anything around them before deciding to pull over and just rest for the night and they take a blanket out of their car they place that blanket on the bonnet of their car and they lie back on that blanket, feeling the warmth from the bonnet through the blanket, gazing up at those stars, feeling the cool breeze of the evening, watching the occasional shooting star streak across the sky. before heading back into the car reclining the seat wrapping that blanket around them and drifting and floating so peacefully so comfortably asleep and the next day they continue their drive until eventually, after many hours of driving, they find themselves arriving at the coast. And they knew they were arriving at the coast before they could see the coast. They could already begin to smell the change in the air. They could already begin to notice the shift in the temperature. Noticing the shift in the breeze And they arrived at the coast, parked up their car, and there was nobody here. And they walked down to that coast, down onto the sand. They could hear the sounds of the waves rolling in across that sand 
the sound of those waves pulling some of that sand back out into the sea. They could see the way the waves rolled in and pulled back out as they bubbled across the sand. And they took their shoes and socks off and they walked a little way into the water to feel that sea, to feel that water rolling in over their feet and pulling back out again to see. And this man set up a tent a little way from the shore and slightly up a bank in a sheltered section near that sea. up near some of the trees. And they cleared a space and they lit a campfire. And they settled down into that tent, feeling a sense of peace and calmness. But finally, having reached here, and they had themselves something to eat, relaxed back in that tent, and started reading a book. And their goal was just to travel here to be able to enjoy some peace and calm with nature. They knew that this location was so off the beaten track, it was unlikely anyone else would be here. And they knew that the journey here would all be worth it to have this sense of peace and calm. And as evening set in, so they enjoyed walking through the water and the edge of the shore, while admiring the night sky, before settling down in their tent. And during the night, while they were drifting, between sleep and wakefulness, they could occasionally hear splashing in the sea. And the next day, they noticed that there were dolphins not that far away from the shore. And they were jumping and flipping and splashing and just swimming around and looking like they were playing. And this man had an inflatable boat with them. And they knew that the dolphins could be gone by the time they get into the water. But they couldn't rush blowing up that boat. So they took their time just watching those dolphins while they blew up that boat before carrying that boat down to the shore. Putting the boat on the water, climbing into that boat, and with their hands they paddled out towards the dolphins. And the dolphins just seemed to be swimming around where they were. They didn't back away or try to move. They allowed the man to come all the way to where they were.
and as that man approached where the dolphins were, he stopped paddling and just let his boat float. And it floated gently to that location, with that gentle sound of the water lapping on the underside of the boat. The sploshing sound of dolphins occasionally reaching the surface with their heads, catching a breath and then disappearing beneath the water again. And for a moment, they didn't seem to be playing so much. They were being much calmer around the boat. And then, almost as if they had that sense that they had understood the boat now and how they can behave around it, some of them started jumping out the water, flipping, splashing down, jumping out the water, facing their back towards the water, splashing down. And then one of the dolphins came over to the boat and swam right up to the front of the boat, rose its head out the boat and seemed to rest its chin on the edge of the boat. The man leant forward and gently stroked that dolphin. And the dolphin slid back off the boat and under the water again. And the man sat back again, just watching, just enjoying the experience. And then again, that dolphin came up and rested its head there again, and this time let out a series of clicks in the direction of the man. And the man had this feeling like he could be aware of those clicks passing through his body, almost as if those clicks had reverberated within him. And the dolphin let out another series of clicks. And there was something about the frequency of those clicks that resonated calmness and relaxation through his body. Almost a tingling from the top of his head, down his shoulders, all the way down to his hands, through his chest, his upper back, his lower back, his stomach, and all the way down into his legs. Almost like quick fire series of gently massaging clicks or bubbles. And this man began to feel a sense of deep peace and relaxation. As that dolphin backed off again, went back into the water, and then after a while came back again rested its head back where it was and let out another series of clicks. And the man started having this weird sensation of being able to understand the dolphin and then started to have this sense of almost images or a language through pictures in his mind. And then he began to understand those pictures as that dolphin continued to click. And the dolphin started to communicate with him that they're intelligent beings and that they had learned how to click with certain targeted frequencies. To be able to trigger thoughts, ideas and memories in the brains of other animals.
and that that's what they're doing here. They're clicking in the direction of the person's head and triggering vibrations in the brain at specific frequencies in specific locations that trigger visual imagery, sounds, feelings. It's almost like having an experience of language without words. And that the human brain will give its own language interpretation, almost like the images triggered are an intermediate language between a language that the dolphin would use and a language that a human would use. And the man found himself incredibly still and focused and calm and found this experience profound and as the dolphin beamed those vibrations into the brain of the man so the man had this feeling almost like someone was tickling inside his head with the most calm and pleasant feeling. And the dolphin started sharing with the man about their way of life, about their perspective on the world and how they see what happens and live their life. And the man feels this deep connection with the dolphin, but feels at a loss because they would love to be able to communicate back. And although the dolphin can communicate with them, they can't transmit clicks and can't communicate their language back to the dolphin. And the dolphin acknowledges this and can tell from the changes to the heart rate, from other changes they can detect, that this person was upset that they couldn't communicate back what they would like to communicate. And the dolphin explained that that's okay. Sometimes just being present and listening is enough. And after the experience, the dolphin backs off the boat and disappears back under the water. And then all the dolphins start to swim away, with some occasionally jumping, twisting in the air, splashing down, as they move further and further away before he finds himself just resting in that boat in silence with just the sound of the water lapping on the boat around him. And then with his hands he begins to paddle back towards the shore. And when near the shore he allows those waves to do the work for him of pushing that boat up onto the sand and as it slides up on that sand, making that gravelly sliding sound, he climbs out the front of the boat, carries his boat up near his tent. And so that his boat won't 
fly away with any breeze. He starts letting the air out of that boat and just rests on the boat while thinking about the experience that he'd had and while trying to process all the mental imagery, auditory sensations, feelings that he'd had during that experience. Just leaning on that boat, with the air hissing out of the boat. And it takes a while for all the air to leave that boat. And once all the air is out of the boat, he rolls that boat up, places that boat back in his car, before heading back to the tent relighting the fire, having himself something to eat, and just continuing to rest and enjoy this beach experience. But the whole time he's enjoying the experience, sometimes stopping and reading, sometimes just gazing off into space and listening to the surroundings, he finds a part of his mind frequently drawn to that connection with the dolphin and to try and process everything the dolphin had communicated. And then as the sun begins to set, he calms himself down into the tent relaxes into a sleeping bag, listens to the sound of the breeze blowing the sides of the tent, sound of that sea rolling in and out, the rustling sound of the leaves. and he drifts and floats so peacefully and calmly asleep. And the next morning, he knows he's only going to spend this day here, before setting off in the evening to begin his journey back home where he'll spend a number of hours until gone midnight driving along that straight road. He'll pull over for the night and then spend the whole next day driving to get home. And so that day he wants to make the most of this day here at the beach. He heads down to the water. He feels how calm that water is. And his mind is still full of thoughts of that dolphin and that connection. As he rests himself on his back, just floating on that seawater. And while he just rests there floating, with that water not feeling hot, not feeling cold, and being a temperature that almost feels like there's no water touching him at all. And he rests there on his back, closes his eyes, lets his arms and legs float away from his body to help him to keep his balance on his back, his ears just under the water. He can feel himself gently bobbing up and down on that water. He can enjoy that weightless sensation of being on the water, feeling the warmth of the sun on his face, on his cheeks, the slight pinkish glow through his eyelids, and can hear 
the sound through his ears of those distant dolphins and distant sound of some whales and he's curious about the experiences of these other animals that they are obviously highly intelligent and can obviously some of them communicate with humans but based on the way they are and the lives they lead humans don't treat them as being as intelligent as they really are and yet he's had this experience of a dolphin sharing what it's like to live as a dolphin what their inner experience is what their beliefs are what they do with their days what they do for fun what they think about the world they inhabit and as he rests there on his back floating on the water, he wonders with the dolphins if things had been different would have developed technology and perhaps been as advanced as humans or whether being advanced like humans is just a human measure of what is important because it's what's important to the humans, not necessarily what's important to a dolphin. And he just listens underwater with his ears while thinking about these things, while floating weightless on the sea. And then after floating there a while, he swims around in the sea, swimming up and down, almost like he's doing lengths in a swimming pool, just picking two points on the shore. But he uses his markers and he swims along from one point, turns around and swims back to the other, before leaving that water, heading up onto the shore, letting himself dry in the sun, And then as the evening sets in, he has one last meal at the campfire, notices that the sun is now beginning to set and finishes up just after the sun has set over the horizon, where there's still a red sky glowing, but no sun in the sky. He packs everything away, gets back in his car and begins his journey home. And he drives for a number of hours, late into the night, into the early hours of the morning, where he then pulls over his car, sleeps the night in his car, has something to eat the next day and then continues his journey home and towards the end of that day he arrives home he packs everything away sorts everything out and is so pleased to be able to settle down in his own bed after sleeping on the ground in a tent for a few days and sleeping in a car seat and he settles down in his bed and really appreciates how comfortable and calming that bed is and as he drifts to sleep he reviews his experiences of the days that he's just had and almost smiling in his mind at the connection that he had had with that dolphin. He drifted and floated and relaxed so peacefully, so comfortably asleep, 
knowing he'll feel fully refreshed and revitalized in the morning, drifting and floating so peacefully, so comfortably asleep. Just take a moment to allow your eyes to close and allow yourself to begin to relax. And as you begin to comfortably drift asleep, I don't know whether you'll drift asleep faster to the sound of my voice or whether it'll be to the spaces between my words. And as you comfortably drift asleep, I'm just going to tell this sleep meditation in the background. And it's a sleep meditation about a man who is known locally as the grumpy old man. And he keeps himself to himself. He always keeps his lights off. And occasionally people just see his shadow pass across windows. Normally from the one candle that he'll have lit in a room. And no one has ever seen him leave his house. And whenever a bull lands in his garden. The children jump the fence to collect the bull. And they just have that sense of him standing at the window, almost glaring as if to say, just grab the ball and go. And so, to everyone, he appears like a grumpy old man. And all the locals talk about him as being the grumpy old man. And yet, in reality, none of them have ever sat down, talked to him. They're making that conclusion from the fact that he doesn't engage with them, that he doesn't talk to them, and that they've never really seen him. And this grumpy old man is sitting at home in his favourite armchair where he sinks down so comfortably with his elbows sinking down into the rests of the chair and his back sinking into the back of the chair and the room lit by just one candle resting on a table near the chair with the light from that candle dancing around the room, making shadows jump and twitch as the light flickers. With just enough light for him to be able to sit there and read an old book. And he's very slow at reading. He really takes his time over every word, over every paragraph, takes his time to work through every page, slowly reading a page, and then incredibly carefully, as if the book is delicate, he carefully turns the page, and slowly reads down the next page. And while he sits there, in that chair, incredibly comfortably reading that book. So, his breathing slows down. And he drifts and relaxes deeper and deeper into the experience. With all of his attention 
on the experience of reading that book. And he likes to give all of his attention to the task at hand. If he's walking, he likes to be totally absorbed in the act of walking. If he's reading, he likes to be totally absorbed in the act of reading. If he's making food, he likes to be totally absorbed in the act of making food. Whatever he's doing, he likes to pay that his full attention. And he's very good at picking up on his own inner signals. And so he knows when his body is telling him that it's time to close the book. And so he closes that book places it carefully down on the table beside him. Makes sure that it's in exactly the right position on that table. And then sits back into that chair for a moment. Just listening to the silence. Listening to the natural ambience of his environment. Aware that although he thinks of it as silent, it's not truly silent. There are subtle sounds in the environment that you can just overlook and don't even notice are there, like maybe a slight humming or some other subtle noises, maybe just natural noises in the house. Perhaps even slight noises from outside, like the sound of the wind, the sound of passing distant traffic, or planes overhead, that go almost unnoticed, but which you would notice are missing if it truly was silent. That there's something about authentic silence that can feel strange because it doesn't really exist. And so he rests there and he can hear just that subtle flicker of the candlelight, of that flame dancing with the slightest movement of the air in the room. And you can notice the way that light dances around the room. And even when he closes his eyes, he's aware of the way the light dances through his eyelids, creating patterns of light and dark. And he can smell the smell of that candle as it burns. And hear the sound of that candle. Hearing the sound of the flame. Hearing the sound of the wax slightly bubbling and popping. As it melts a little bit near the flame. And then he moves out of that seat, carrying the candle with him. He takes a key out of his pocket, and it's a skeleton key that can open any of the doors in his house and any of the locks in his house. That there's one key for the front door. There's one key for the back door. But once you're in the house, 
there's one key that opens everything. When he walks through the house, he heads to what looks like a door under the stairs. He puts the key into that wooden door. He jiggles that key around a little bit to get it fully into the lock. And then with a click, he twists that key in the lock. And the lock clicks open. And with a creak, he opens the door, walks through the door, closing it behind him, locking it behind him. And just lit by candlelight, he can see the wooden steps descending in front of him. And his footsteps echo and reverberate on those wooden steps. As he descends those steps into a room under his house, going deeper and deeper under his house with each step, from ten, nine, eight, seven, six, feeling a sense of the air changing slightly, five, four, feeling a deeper sense of relaxation and noticing the silence down here is even more silent than the silence upstairs. Three, two, one, stepping onto the wooden ground down here. With that candlelight just barely illuminating the room. And he walks across that room, each footstep echoing through the room. And as he walks across the room, so a grand piano, so perfectly polished, comes into view. And he sits down at that grand piano. He places that candle into a candle holder that's on the side of the piano. He lifts the lid. He randomly and gently touches a few of the notes with one finger, feeling the weight of the note, the weight of each key with each press, hearing the note play out through that piano. Before relaxing his shoulders, resting both hands down, those fingers gently on the keys. And then, beginning to play. And at first, while he's playing, he follows those fingers, he looks at them. He watches what they're doing, where they're going. But then after a short while, it's as if the fingers take care of themselves. where the fingers play independent of his mind. His mind just drifts with the music, becomes absorbed in the music, almost as if there's a light dancing up from the inside of that piano. Almost like coloured mist and fog. 
that's brighter with more powerful notes and more pastely with softer played notes and the colors mix and mingle as different notes are played almost like there's an aurora dancing out of that piano and almost with his eyes glazed over gazing off into space he watches this light show playing out before him as his ears hear the music and his fingers feel the music and the experience spreads through into his body and seems to resonate through his mind and then out of this light show playing before him that begins to spread around him and it begins to transform into a different world where he's no longer in a dark room with a single candle lighting it. But as he plays, it's as if that light transforms, opening the room up, spreading the room out in all directions, taking down the walls, and revealing himself to be playing in the most beautiful meadow, where off in the distance on the horizon he can see the ocean and between here and there it's a meadow and rolling hills and him at this most beautiful black piano playing this music only now the light is like butterflies flying around the piano with many colours almost dancing around the piano to the music and spreading from the piano out across the meadow flying to different flowers of multicolours flying off into nearby woodland up into the trees and yet he holds his focus and keeps his focus on being in that moment, absorbed in the playing. And as he continues playing, so this reality becomes increasingly real to him. So real that as his fingers stop playing, the reality remains. And he has this sense of standing up, of walking away from the piano. And as he does, and walks a little way through the meadow, feeling that grass around his leg feeling what each footstep feels like to take here, feeling the warmth of the sun on his face, the slight breeze on his cheeks, hearing distant birds and the rustling leaves of the trees. Seeing the top of a dandelion caught with the breeze, and what looks almost like thousands of parachutes floating through the air caught in the wind to descend throughout the meadow he stops and turns around and looks back towards the piano and he can see himself sat there motionless 
as if in the middle of playing, as if he sat there, has had time standing still for him, and yet this projection of him has moved out of his body, leaving him in that location in time to explore this land he's created with his music. And he walks in a very mindful way through the meadow, down towards a calm river that heads out to the sea. And as he reaches the river, so he can notice that slight watery smell to the air. He can hear the sound of the flowing water. And he decides to walk in the water, just in the shallow edge of that river, feeling the coolness of the water as it passes over and around his feet and his ankles and the sloshing as he walks through the water heading down towards the sea and while he walks towards the sea so the sun continues passing across the sky and as it passes across the sky so the sky changes colour from blue to different shades of oranges, yellows and reds, and some pink. And the sun gets lower and lower to the horizon. And he arrives at the mouth of that river, can hear the sound of the sea gently lapping on the shore and stands here in the sand as his feet sink slightly into the sand with a slight tickle touch of the sand over and between his toes as each small wave rolls in over his feet and then pulls back out to sea, rolling in, moving some sand over his feet and then rolling out, pulling some sand back across his feet. And he realizes that his breathing has fallen in time with that sea, with those waves rolling in and rolling out. As he just stands there, almost motionless, watching that sun gently setting over the horizon. And while the sun setting over the horizon, he hears a noise behind him almost like a lifting and then a sploshing noise and a slight scraping noise. And with curiosity, he turns around and he can see this turtle working its way down the wet sand, sliding on its belly, almost trying to drag its way to the sea. And he watches as that turtle, which must be almost as big as he is, pulling its way down the shore. And while he watches, he thinks about what it would be like to pull his own body along the ground like that, and how he would probably find that difficult 
if he couldn't just stand up and walk, to use his arms and his legs, with his belly on the floor, to try to move himself like the turtle, and thinks it must be even more difficult with the shell the turtle has. And he watches as that turtle reaches the water and he walks down towards the water to continue to watch the turtle and he walks a little way into the sea just up to his knees with the occasional wave being just over his knees and he sees that once that turtle is a little way into the water. The water holds its weight and suddenly it's able to swim so gracefully, almost like it's flying through the water in slow motion, like with the slightest movement, it's able to turn and twist and move around in the water and fly through that water so easily and effortlessly. And as he turns back towards the sun, he notices that it's now set fully over the horizon and yet there is still the red glow of the sun in the sky, but looking the other direction reveals a dark blue and the rising moon and overhead he notices stars twinkling to life and he walks through the sand along the seashore, really allowing himself to be absorbed in the experience, listening to the way the waves lap on the shore, hearing the music in those waves, noticing the way the waves seem to glow slightly with specific colours for the different tones they make as they roll in and land on the shore and the different colours and the sparkling light which comes off the sand with the note the sand plays as it's pulled out into the sea. and he continues to walk and then he sees that the hills a little way along here have turned into cliff faces and he can notice that in one of the cliff faces there appears to be a dark mark that he assumes might be a cave and so he heads over towards that and as he does to him that cave seems so illuminated because of the way the sound of the sea heads into that cave deepens increases in volume and reverberates around the cave almost turning that cave into a musical instrument and that loud deep note that reverberates through the cave makes that cave glow with the most beautiful electric blue colour and he walks into the cave and notices the electric blue change slightly as he enters he realises how large this cave is 
almost like walking into a cathedral. He can notice that high overhead are stalactites clinging on to the ceiling. And almost like pillars in the ground, he navigates his way around the stalagmites, climbing up out of the ground. And as he explores, he starts to notice that the colours are changing, that there's a deep purple colour off in the distance. And he heads deeper into this cave towards that purple colour, towards that purple vibrant light. And as he walks towards that, so he starts to hear a low rumbling sound. And as he nears that sound, he realises that Some water, probably from the river, must have worked its way through the ground and it's now become this waterfall pouring down through a chamber into a lake below. And he watches the purple light coming off that waterfall, off where it's landing in the lake. He watches the twinkling lights around the edge of the lake and where the water is splashing back down gently further from the waterfall. And he heads down towards that underground lake. And as he heads down, he notices that in this lake, there are some ducks, there are some geese, there are some other birds swimming around, and some just sitting on the shore. He sees what looks like golden geese eggs in a nest on the shore. But he doesn't feel brave enough to head over, to take a closer look, aware that the geese may not be overly happy with that, and he walks around that lake, and he finds somewhere to sit near the lake, and as he sits near that lake, he closes his eyes and just listens, almost as if his ears are marking out the shape of this cave from the sounds and the way the sound bounces around the walls. And while he's listening, not only can he visualize in his mind's eye the shape of the entrance, the shape of the cathedral-like cavern he'd walked through, and the shape of this section. He could even hear the sound of the flowing water that led to the waterfall and make out the shape of the cave that is being carved by that bit of river that's flowing into here. And then he can make out the shape of this section and even make out how large the space is under the surface of the water from the deep sound resonating up from the way the waterfall is creating that deep note over at one side. 
But what he notices is that there's also another sound, another resonance. And he realizes that in here is another chamber. But it appears like it's a chamber with a smaller entrance. And so he relaxes deeper and focuses even more on the subtle sound, that slight variation in a note. allowing him to pinpoint where that entrance is. He then opens his eyes. And as he opens his eyes, he can see all the colors of the notes around him. And he walks around and carefully past the golden eggs, finds his way round to the far side of the lake, where he sees what looks like a small tunnel. And he has to crouch down to squeeze through that tunnel. And so he crouches, squeezes gently through that tunnel. Here's the sound of the waterfall fading behind him. And can hear the subtle sound of dripping in front of him. And it very quickly opens up into another vast chamber, all under that meadow overhead. And in this chamber, a lot of that sound of the waterfall seems to get absorbed in the twists and turns of the tunnel to this chamber. where in this chamber he's able to focus on the sound of individual drops falling from the ceiling and the silence between the drops. And he's aware of the time between the drop falling from the ceiling and reaching the ground. He can see the slight twinkle as there's a subtle sound of the drop just about to leave the ceiling, which to him and his perception is almost like a very, very tiny explosion, almost like a pinprick of light above him. And then there's a delay. And then there's a deeper colour as that droplet lands on the ground. And a slight wave of colour spreading from that point. And every moment he sees a few of these in this cave. And he walks slowly through the cave, walking quietly as he goes, feeling that this place has a certain silence to it that makes him almost treat it like a library, like somewhere that he should be quieter in. And he has this sense of exploration. And then he hears the strangest sound. Sounding almost like a thousand twinkling bells. And as he continues walking, he notices the strangest thing. 
he notices a large tree at the far end of this cave. And the large tree is illuminated from the back by what look like giant emeralds around the back top of this cave that somehow seem to have light passing through them. And as he walks around, walks over to the tree, reaches out, touches the bark of the tree with the tips of his fingers, runs them gently over that bark, closing his eyes to really appreciate the feeling of that tree, almost having a sense of being grounded with this reality by running his fingers around that tree. With his eyes closed, it heightens his senses, and with his senses heightened, he realises there's a slight hum to the sounds from those emeralds. And as he mentally analyses that hum, he realises that somehow Perhaps the movement of water, maybe something else, is generating an electrical charge through those emerald-like stones, those emerald-like crystals, and that that is somehow illuminating the back of this cave. And while he runs his fingers around the bark of the tree, he notices that it seems to change subtly depending on where his hand is, and realises that the tree is slightly more dense on the side facing the emeralds. And as he looks up and looks around the leaves of the tree, he realises that the branches are growing slightly more in the direction of the emeralds. The leaves are slightly more facing the emeralds than the other direction. And that somehow this tree seems to be given light. That it seems to be able to convert into energy from those emeralds. And as he stands back from the tree to really take in what he's observing, he notices that high up in the tree is what looks like a box just resting on a branch. And it looks like a really old wooden box. And he climbs all the way up, carefully to that box. He picks up that box, tips it over, tips it back up the right way. You can hear that there's something soft inside it, something light inside the box. He lifts the lid and inside he finds a paper map. And it seems to be a map of the caves. And nearly everything on the map he already knows. He can recognise the way in, he can recognise the coastline, he can recognise that lake the waterfall and the tunnel to here and the tree. But he sees that there's one more place marked on the map. And he decides to go and investigate. 
and as he looks around the ground, trying to find that location, he sees a ruby on the ground, just seemingly in the mud, and it's right where the tunnel is to another part of this cave system. But all he sees is a ruby and mud. And he goes and picks that ruby up. And as he does, he notices the back side of that ruby is actually attached to a trapdoor that's hidden under the mud. And he pulls on that and the trapdoor easily comes up from the ground. And he looks down and sees some steps down into a tunnel. He follows those steps, 10, nine, eight, going deeper and deeper under this cave, seven, six, Five, four, three, two, one, finding himself in a tunnel deep under that cave system. And he walks along following this tunnel. And he reaches a point where the sound changes. It begins to echo a lot more. And what this tunnel is made of seems to change. There's less mud and rock. And it seems to turn into almost reflective stone. And he recognizes that some of that stone is magnetic. And some of it almost seems to be reflective. Almost like it's polished. And then he finds himself stood facing an image of himself and realizes that it's just like a mirror. And as he turns to the side, he sees himself again and realizes that he's entered into a mirror maze. And as he walks around, he notices some areas seem to have what's like sheets of glass that restrict his path, and so he has to find alternative routes. And other areas, he walks straight at a mirror. And so he carefully in a very mindful and measured way and very calmly walks around that maze running his fingers around the mirrors and the glass as he carefully and gently and calmly finds his way around and the further round this maze he gets the more he can hear a slight humming in the distance. And he's curious what it is that he's going to find. And after some time navigating the maze, sometimes taking the wrong routes and having to backtrack He comes out into a large opening similar to the caverns he's been in before. Only in the middle of this cavern, he sees a grey stone and the cavern is illuminated by bright green glowing mushrooms poking out of the walls and the ceiling. And on that grey stone, 
he sees a blue bird. And that blue bird appears to be humming a very familiar tune. And although that tune is very familiar, it sits on the tip of his tongue and is unsure exactly what that tune is, and yet something about it is resonating through his mind and body with a deep sense of familiarity. And he walks towards that humming bird. And when he's nearly at the bird, the bird stops humming, looks up at him and says to him that he's come here to find himself and to find something that he didn't even know he had lost. And that he needs to head on past this stone to the back of this cave. And so he walks on and as he does he notices that the ground gets damper and damper. and that the mud under his feet becomes increasingly squelchy. And then, just as his feet are starting to stick more in the mud, he notices a bit of movement coming from the deeper, more sloppy, muddy area. And then a slight buzzing coming from that area and a slight bubbling from under the mud. And then out of that mud, he sees a small fairy and it crawls its way out from under the mud. and it asks him to pass it a pine cone. And it blows into that pine cone. And as it does, so the pine cone starts to open up. And bits start falling out of that pine cone. And then the pine cone starts to sparkle and shimmer and that begins to sparkle and shimmer around the fairy. And as it sparkles and shimmers around the fairy, so the fairy's wings begin to turn golden and white. They begin to look more full. And it's almost as if the mud just falls off of that fairy as they then fly up above the mud and he can hear the high-pitched hum of the fairy's wings and see a slight orangey glow coming from the back of the fairy And that glow is a very consistent glow of that very consistent note. And the fairy explains like the blue bird explained that he was here to find something he didn't even know he'd lost.
that he was here to find himself and his connection and that he would know what he came here to find when he leaves here and it's only then that he'll realise where he has been and he asks the fairy where they came from and they said that they're the mud fairy that fairies are born out of all sorts of things but fairies are only born when they're needed that they hibernate that they kind of take on a different form until they're needed and then it's almost like them being needed is a bit like watering a plant that can turn a seed into something new and that they can then be there to support you on your journey ahead that with the lesson you're learning and why you're here and what you're going to discover they can support you because you'll need more support beyond what you think you're going to need and then that fairy flies off disappears up high in the cave and seems to find their way out of the cave somehow and as they do the bluebird says that it's time to go back and so the man begins to head back through the caves and they can hear that bluebird humming away in the background as they walk back through the caves they head out of the caves back to that beach where now it's a deep dark night time watching the most beautiful blanket of stars overhead twinkling in the sky heading back up through the meadow and then seeing themselves at that piano still motionless as if midway through playing and while they watch themselves they start to have this sense of drifting back into themselves And then they have a sense of their fingertips moving on that piano again. And then that music continues to play. And then as the music comes to an end, so this world fades away and they find themselves sat in their basement at their piano with the flickering light of their candle and as they finish playing so they close the piano they stand up and walk away from the piano and as they do they notice that their feet seem to be muddy and that they can smell that mud and they can smell the smell of seawater and they walk up the stairs to the main part of the house and they head up to bed the whole time curious about the experience that they've had about how real it seemed 
and the fact that not only did it seem real, but they even have solid evidence that something more than just playing the piano happened in the basement. And they change for bed. They put that candle by their bedside. They settle down in the bed. They read a book for a little while under that candlelight. Before blowing out the candle, noticing that smell of that candle as the darkness surrounds them in the room with just the slightest hint of moonlight coming into the bedroom. As the breeze catches the shutters and makes the shutters over the windows rattle slightly before becoming really calm and relaxed. And they drift and float so comfortably and relaxed asleep. And the next day, they feel this overwhelming urge to leave their house. And they head to the living room. They look out of the window. And they can see the life out there. People smiling at each other, chatting with each other. Cars going past. No one seeming to have a care in the world. And then a few hours later, they look back out the window again. Still with that overwhelming urge to go outside. But not yet feeling like they can. Not knowing how they should. And then they notice the sky turning grey. It begins to rain. And that rain gets heavier and heavier. And they decide that now is the best time to venture out for the first time in a very long time. And so they grab themselves the homemade umbrella. They open the front door. They poke the umbrella outside the door. They pop that umbrella up. And the umbrella covers almost half their body. As they walk through their front door and into the umbrella, closing their front door behind them and holding on to the umbrella with that transparent umbrella over their head and down both their sides and behind them and in front of them with that rain pounding on the outside of the umbrella, almost like they're carrying their own personal tent, where only their kneecaps downwards are likely to get wet from any rain. And that's only if the rain can come at an angle to catch them. They can hear the sound of that rain sounding so gentle and relaxing on that umbrella. And in a very mindful way, they gently walk down one street, noticing how few people are out here. And they pass someone carrying an umbrella above their head, who smiles and says hello, and says that they would like an umbrella like that. As they look at their arms and how wet they've got. And a bit further down the road, someone else does something very similar. And down another road, someone else 
smiles and comments again. And they head to a nearby park. And despite the rain, they sit down on a bench, almost tucked up under their umbrella, resting the umbrella on the bench, keeping their legs tucked in. Hearing that rain on the umbrella, on the bench around them, hearing the sound of the rain as it strikes the leaves of the trees behind them, watching the sheets of rain pass across the park and off into the distance. And as that rain passes, so the sun eventually manages to break through. And they can still see the rain, but they now notice the most vivid rainbow appear in the sky. And then as that rainbow appears in the sky, they start to hear the chirping of birds. And then they start to see some birds flying overhead. And then they see a little ladybird land on the bench beside them and they watch as it walks along the arm of the bench tucking its wings gently on its back under its colorful plates and then after a little while launching itself back off and disappearing off out of view. And then someone walking a dog smiles and acknowledges them again. And they think to themselves that they haven't had this many people talking to them in years. And that all these people seem so friendly. And they can smell that fresh, after rain air. As they fold up their umbrella. And head home. And as the evening sets in. So the warmth through the afternoon and into the evening starts to evaporate up that water, creating mist across the garden, across the roads in the distance. And they just feel this sense of wanting to sit outside, outside the front of their property, on a bench in their garden, and sit and read in their garden. And for the first time in years, they sit reading in that garden, breathing in that fresh air watching and hearing people walk past, smiling as people acknowledge them sat there. And then they see a sparkling of light at the end of their garden and spy that fairy landing on a sunflower. and have a sense of that fairy looking over at them, as if to acknowledge that they're always there watching over them, supporting them, as they move and transition into this new stage of their life. 
and all the discoveries that they'll make. And then almost in the blink of an eye, that fairy seems to disappear from that sunflower and almost like a flash of light flies off with a slight hum. And that night, the grumpy old man settles down with a smile on their face and curiosity in their heart and falls so deeply and comfortably asleep knowing that they'll wake up in the morning and that they'll go out and explore. They're now curious about the world outside their house and what they can learn and discover out there. And with that deep sense of curiosity they drift and float so peacefully and so comfortably asleep. Just take a moment to allow your eyes to close and allow yourself to begin to relax. And as you begin to relax, I don't know whether you'll drift deeper to the sound of my voice or to the spaces between my words. And as you begin to relax and drift with this sleep meditation, I'm just going to tell a story about a kitten. And this kitten lives in a little cabin in Scotland. And one snowy day, the kitten's resting in front of the fire and they're having the most incredible dreams. The legs gently twitching as they imagine running around. And then they hear the sound of their human preparing some food. So they quickly jolt awake as if that sound triggers something inside them. And they can smell the food being prepared. And they walk through to the kitchen. And on the kitchen floor, in the kitten's eating space, the kitten sees a haggis resting on a plate. And they can feel their mouth beginning to water as they smell that haggis. And they approach the haggis. And in the most careful way, this little kitten uses their first claw to carefully cut that open. And almost like it's doing precision surgery, the kitten carefully cuts slices. And with the tip of its claw, it pulls out tiny slices and slides them onto a separate plate. And the human just stands and watches, always amazed at how this kitten seems to think that it's always fine dining. As that kitten carefully cuts the perfect slices for its mouth and eats those slices of haggis. And the haggis is almost the size of the kitten and yet the kitten seems to manage to eat half of it in one sitting before tootling over to the human and looking up at the human as if to say can you save the rest for me for later? I need to go and burn off what I've currently eaten.
And then that kitten heads outside through the cat flap and tries to almost tiptoe through the snow outside. But each step, it just sinks through that little bit of snow. But it continues to try to tiptoe. And the kitten goes on its walk through that snow. It can notice how the sounds are dulled by the snowy environment. How the light is dimmer with the grey clouds overhead. The air smells fresh. And there's the crunching of each footstep that kitten takes. Like really tiny little crunches, almost like walking on individual crisps. And as the kitten walks through the snow, so they begin to wish that it was a little warmer, that they're going out for a walk. They wish it was a little warmer. And they start to think of what it would be like to be wearing mittens. Because they've heard that you can buy mittens for kittens, and they like the idea of being one of those kittens in mittens. But they didn't know how well that would work walking in the snow. They worried that their little mittens might gather up all the snow. The snow might stick to them and make it harder to walk through this snow. And so they continue walking around the outside of this garden. And as they walk around out in the snow, outside their home, walking through the garden, roaming around. The human exits the property and they're wrapped up in their thickest coat and they've got their mittens as they walk out and they slide their hands into their mittens. They head round to the shed. They carefully open the shed. And inside the shed, they pull out a partially carved bit of wood. And standing that in the garden, they continue to shape and carve that piece of wood and the kitten stops for a moment to watch them curious what it is that they'll be carving trying to work out what it looks like it's becoming and they watch for a little while seeing the person chipping bits off carefully sliding bits of wood off, almost like shavings of wood. And the person seems to get so absorbed in what they're doing, as if they're lost in their own world. And the kitten continues to explore around the garden, trying to burn off some of that food before they head back to the house and they head into the house and they sit themselves down in front of the fire allow themselves to begin to warm up before tilting back 
into a seated position on the back two legs, closing their eyes, imagining themselves in a yoga pose like they'd seen on the TV. And they focus on keeping their balance. And as they focus on keeping their balance, feeling the warmth of that fire on their face, on their fur, feeling the way they move ever so slightly while keeping their balance, hearing the crackling of the fire. They begin to drift into their own little reverie. They drift inside their mind, focusing on the idea of maintaining balance. And as they focus on that idea of maintaining balance, so they start to hear the sound of rollerblades. And they find themselves rollerblading along the promenade of the most beautiful beach, gazing out on a summer's day over the sea, over the sand, the blue sky, hearing birds overhead. passing all these humans that are much larger than they are. There's a little kitten with the rollerblades on its back feet, rollerblading along that promenade, the sound of each push of the rollerblades on the ground, the feeling of the breeze on their fur, the warmth of that sun, saying hello in a kitten squeaky meow to every person they pass, thinking that they look so cool. And they do twists and turns, and they see a little skate park. And there's no one in the skate park, so they decide to roll a blade into the skate park. And they speed along, they do some backflips. They try and grind along a bar. And they almost fall when they turn it into something cool and make it look like it was on purpose as they bounce on one front paw and land back on their feet. And as they continue along the promenade. They suddenly find something glistening and glinting that catches their eye and draws them towards it. As if it's somehow reflecting light straight at them. And as they get closer, they can hear a boombox but all they can really make out is the beat coming from that boombox. And next to it, they see this six foot robot dancing. And they imagined that it would dance like when you say to a person to do a robot dance, but instead it's dancing so much more fluidly and it looks incredibly heavy and yet seems so light on its feet. Jumping both feet apart, toes pointing slightly out, flicking the heels out, bending the knees, launching, twisting, landing, facing forward again. Seemingly moving every part of their body. managing to make sure that there seems to be no part that remains totally stationary. Every part is moving to the music. 
and they stop captivated by this dancing robot, along with many others. And as quick as this robot seemed to have started dancing, it seemed to suddenly stop. And once it stopped, people started putting money in a box that was in front of this robot. And it was almost as if once there was a certain amount of money placed into that box, the robot was happy to start dancing again and the music would start and the robot would dance. And once the kitten had watched that robot a while and realised the robot seemed to only have one dance routine they knew, they did it really well, but they only had one dance routine. They carried on along the promenade wondering what else would be along here. And they saw someone dunking rope into soapy water and carefully with two hands pulling that rope out of the soapy water, carefully waving and parting that rope to create these really long flowing bubbles with rainbow colours spiralling along the bubbles and catching the sunlight before eventually the bubble would burst. And almost in slow motion, you could see that bubble bursting until it's just to a point of liquid that would drop to the floor. And they continued along the promenade until they reached a turning up a hill and into some woodland and they took off their roller blades, put them in a little backpack, placed that backpack back on their back, and walked on all fours up into the woodland. And as they walked up into the woodland, so the sounds were left behind them of the beach, the seabirds, of the people on the beach and the promenade, of that boombox in the distance, the sound of the water rolling into the shore. They started to hear the sounds of songbirds, the sounds of the rustling leaves. They walked deeper into the woods. They turned off the main path. Wandered among the trees. Noticed how it got darker among the trees. But the sounds of the rustling leaves got louder. They didn't know where they were heading. They were just exploring. And as they walked, they could hear their tiny little footsteps on the forest floor. And the trees seemed to become more dense until all of a sudden, they saw something they'd never noticed before. They saw what looked like a tree, but no ordinary tree. It was many, many times wider than the other trees around here. It was almost like a wall in the forest. Now, curious by this, they walked to that tree. They ran their claws of one of their paws around the tree, feeling the bark of that tree. 
as their claws bounced along that bark so gently. And they walked a little way round the tree, realising it was so wide. It was so high they couldn't see when they tried to look up, all the way to the top. And so they ended up, once they got round to the other side of the tree, lying on their back, having removed the backpack, resting their head on the backpack, and looking up to try and see the top of the tree. And even then, they couldn't see the top. They could just see that there were branches and leaves way up there, towering so high over the rest of these trees. And they wondered how anything managed to grow down here so close to the tree. They wondered how deep the roots went. And they had tried climbing trees before, but weren't sure whether they could ever climb something like this. And they started digging their claws in and trying to shimmy up the tree a little bit. They could see what looked like a hole in the tree. They wondered whether perhaps it was caused by a woodpecker or some other bird or animal and keeping their stomach as close to the tree as they could, and their forepaws as wide as they could, and almost pinning their cheek to the tree, they carefully shimmied up that tree towards that hole. And as they reached the hole, they carefully reached in with one paw, then the other, and pushed their head in, and then pulled the rest of their body through. And once inside the tree, they allowed a few moments for their eyes to adjust, and their eyes to get used to the darkness inside this tree. And there seemed to be a slight glowing inside the tree enough just to see that there were steps rising up the centre of the tree. So they started ascending those steps. And the wooden steps clinked and clunked under each footstep as the claws tapped on the wooden steps. And that tapping gently echoed around the inside of the tree. And they continued to climb higher and higher. And after what seemed like an incredibly long time, they started to see daylight. And then they came out of a hole at the top, near the top of the tree, that led to a small platform resting around the branches. They walked out onto that platform and they could see over the whole forest. They could see over to distant mountains. Looking the other way, they could see the ocean and the beach. And they realised they were so high up. They could feel the slight swaying of the tree from up here and feel the breeze on their cheeks. And then an owl landed next to them with a hoot and asked them who they were and where they came from. And they explained that they were walking along the seafront, along that promenade. They turned into the trees 
and they found their way here. And the owl said, you look like you're going to get a little cold up here. It's rare for kittens to be this high. And the owl gave them this tiny little tie-dye shirt with bold, bright colours. And they slipped that on over their front paws, over their head, and onto their body. And they thought they probably looked cool in their shirt, but had nothing to look in to find out. They knew that it was exhausting work climbing up here, but it was definitely chillier all the way up here than it was down at the bottom of the tree. And the owl said that there's a secret up here, if you're willing to find it. And then it stepped back a few paces, and with its head it appeared to gesture. And the cat walked around the platform, looking for what was gestured. And as they walked around, they saw that there was a slide and it looked like it spiraled down through the tree and the cat asked is that what you're talking about and the owl just hooted and so the cat jumped into the slide and spiraled in that slide down through the tree and the cat felt like this slide was going on and on and on for so long it seemed like it was going on longer than it took them to walk to the top climbing the stairs and some light was somehow getting into this slide keeping it lightly illuminated as they spiralled down deeper and deeper into the tree and after a while they started getting suspicious because they still seemed to be going further and further down into the tree even though they should have reached the bottom already and they continued descending until eventually the spiralling calmed down they started to slow down their descent. The spiral straightened out. And they slid off the slide and found themselves in a cave deep underground. And inside this cave, they could hear the sound of the ocean. And they realized that some water must be getting into the cave from the sea that it was as if maybe there's an undersea cave and the water gets shunted from out in the ocean and into the cave splashes up somewhere in the cave and it could be heard reverberating and echoing through the whole cave they could feel and taste the slight sea air that slight salty water air inside this cave and they could see what looked like glowing mushrooms illuminating the cave walls with the most beautiful electric blue glow and with curiosity they began to explore and they found the most incredible thing in a corner against what seemed just like a browny black wall was a four-leaf clover somehow growing and there was no other greenery down here and yet 
as this four-leaf clover. And they carefully reach down and with a claw they picked that clover. They took their backpack off and they placed that clover on the outside of their backpack as if to give them good luck. And using a needle and some thread they just carefully sewed around the stem of the clover just to hold it in place on their backpack before putting that backpack back on their back and then continuing to explore this cave and as they explored so the sound of the ocean got louder they realized they must be working their way down in the direction of the sea. Until they found their way to a bit of cave where it looked like there was a lake. And that lake kept rising and falling as if the water is getting pushed in and it rises and then pulled back out as the lake falls. And they could see a faint glow of light shining in through the water at the back of the cave and then bouncing around in the water gently illuminating this bit of cave and gently illuminating this lake. And they can see the way the water in this lake as it shunts in and pulls back out seems to be just wearing away some of the soil at the edge of the cave. And they see what looks like a dinosaur too. And they go over and they carefully pick around that tooth with a claw. And the way it looks, it looks almost like a rotten dinosaur too. It's almost like it's totally withered away. But they know that the actual remnants of a real tooth are probably long gone and that it's more water damage that's been happening more recently on the remains of the fossil. But they still find this interesting and carefully pick that tooth out of the ground, carefully uncover it. while also trying to avoid this water that keeps coming in and back out again. And they manage to get some water on the fossil once it's collected. Just to remove some of that mud before backing away from the water to place that into their backpack. They feel like they're getting a good collection of items here, making this journey worthwhile. And they wonder what their route is to take back to where they need to go, to get back outside of this cave. They can see daylight through the water below. But they wonder whether they could hold their breath long enough to swim down through this water that's coming in at them. Maybe diving in just as the water is pulling out. And maybe that way it would almost suck them out of the cave. 
So then they wonder whether they're a strong enough swimmer. So they decide to look and see if there's an alternative route. And as they continue exploring, they see what looks like a rabbit hole. But instead of a rabbit, they see a turtle. And this turtle is pushing the soil back while trying to push forward through the soil. Almost like it's trying to dig its way out of here. And the little kitten follows that turtle and asks what it's doing. It says it's digging its way out of here. It's nearly there. And the kitten feels that they're probably a lot further underground than the turtle realises. And the turtle says they can smell such things. They know they're nearly there. So the kitten offers to help. And it's muddy work, but the kitten uses its claws to carefully help dig this hole, following the instructions of the turtle. And the turtle happens to be right. That they break through and come out a little way up from the beach. And the turtle thanks the kitten and begins to flop its way along the beach, trying to power its way down to the sea. While the kitten goes to some grass and starts rolling around on the grass, rubbing its paws in the grass, trying to dry itself, clean itself off a bit from the dirt it's got over it. And then it hears what sounds like circus music or fairground music and realises it's come out so far along the beach that it's near the pier. And so that kitten heads up onto the pier, walks along that pier, looks down between the slats of wood at the sea rolling in below. You can see the lights of the pier, the lights of the different amusements, the sounds, the ferris wheel on the pier, tents on the pier with different games. And as they walk along, so, someone looking like a wizard in a purple robe approaches them, leans down, and says, we're looking for some fellows like you. And the kitten feels like they're not quite looking at them. And then this wizard reaches down and carefully picks off some of the fleas from the kitten's back and holds them in his sealed hand. And the kitten wonders what's going on. And they say that they got a little flea circus that needs some fleas. And these will do fine. And the kitten follows that wizard back to their tent. And they place the fleas into the flea circus. And the kitten watches as those fleas, almost straight away, seem to know what they're doing. They start walking a tightrope. They start carrying heavy weights, leaping all over the place, doing acrobatics. And the kitten wondered whether this was the case in the past. They'd imagined that flea circuses were actually not real. That it was tricking people into saying that there are fleas doing these things when actually it was probably mechanical. Like something hitting the inside of the base, making it look like something has just jumped. Or affecting tension on some wire, 
making it look like something has landed on the wire or taken off the wire. The mechanical swings. And yet, here were fleas, genuinely, carrying out circus acts. And the wizard just stood there and smiled. Almost as if they were smugly thinking, you didn't believe that they would do that, did you? And the kitten thought to themselves, you're right, I didn't. And just at that point, the kitten felt perhaps they're starting to get a bit hungry. All this exertion. And the wizard seemed to pick this up and invited them through to a part of the tent. And as they walked through, it was almost as if they walked into an alien world. It didn't look like they were in a tent anymore. Instead, they could see rivers of chocolate. And it smelt strongly like chocolate. They could see marshmallow clouds. The grass seemed to be made of the finest, fluffiest sugar, just waving gently in the breeze. And then it started raining, and out of the clouds, the base of them started to turn a dark brown, and chocolate raindrops started falling from the sky. And it seemed almost like there was very little gravity here because those raindrops were falling so slowly and gently through that sky. And the kitten had that thought of wanting to test this. And so it put its little tongue out and noticed that it was chocolate designed seemingly especially for cats landing on its tongue and the kitten explored and then found that there were pools of milk rivers of chocolate and the kitten thought this seems too tempting too good a thing and the wizard said you don't want to leave here do you And the kitten felt there's got to be something suspicious here. Nothing is this good. And so they decided to try and leave. And the wizard said that you can't leave here yet. And the kitten wondered why and decided to head the opposite way to the wizard. And as this kitten explored, they could hear this humming sound. And so they followed the humming. And they looked back and they could see that wizard just sat there on a bench with a smile on their face, just watching. And they followed the sound of that humming out of sight from the bench. where they found a tree that seemed to be made out of gingerbread. They managed to bite their way into the tree, where some bees flew out of that tree. And these honeybees explained that they do know the way out. And as these honeybees flew out of the tree, so honey started leaking from the cracks in the tree and flowing down on the ground. And the bees said to follow them. And so each of the bees found their toolboxes and went to a solid 
chocolate dam that was holding back a chocolate lake. And they began to tap on that dam with their tools and chisel into that dam. And they said they're doing so at a very specific point. And then eventually they managed to break through this point in the dam and the kitten wondered whether the chocolate lake was going to pour through this chocolate dam. But instead they saw daylight and snow and the bees all flew through and they squeezed their way through and fell from that gap and gently plopped down onto the snow and found themselves back in Scotland not far from where they lived and as they looked up they could just see clouds above them and they felt that they could see the faintest hint of a hole in the clouds where they just fell through and they were curious now whether this was a dream whether they were still actually doing yoga in front of the fireplace dreaming this experience and they head back towards their home and on their way back towards their home they see this one most beautiful red rose managing to break its way through the snow. And they pick that red rose as they journey back. Something to leave in appreciation for the human they live with. They arrive back at their home. They see that the human has nearly finished with their sculpture. And they find their way inside. And they see themselves in the yoga position in front of that fire. And they go over just behind themselves. And they know that they are there dreaming that they're stood behind themselves. While they're stood behind themselves, feeling like themselves, looking at that them dreaming. And then they close their eyes and imagine themselves walking forward into themselves. Before opening their eyes and finding themselves just meditating in a yoga position in front of the fire. But they realize they're now wearing a backpack that they didn't have on. They take that backpack off their back. And they see on the floor next to them is a rose. And they place that rose on the kitchen counter. And they see that four leaf clover on the backpack. And yet they know that backpack was only in their dreams. Not something they've ever really owned. And so they walk outside. They walk around in the snow. They begin to have a feeling of connecting with the here and now connecting with their reality again, almost waking themselves up with that fresh air, feeling alert, making sure that they feel one again. And they watch as the human continues with what they're doing before they go and put the sculpture back, having decided they've done enough work for now into the shed and then the human sits themselves down 
on a bench, just resting after that hard work, wrapped up in their warm coat with their mittens, wrapping their arms around themselves, tucking their elbows in, keeping themselves as warm as they can. And they can see the human taking some deep breaths and seeming to just centre themselves and calm themselves down. And then after a little while, that human walks across the garden, heads into the house, makes them both something to eat. and notices how dirty their cat has got and so runs a tiny little bath for them in a bowl and sees the strangest thing that they're wearing a tie-dye shirt and wonders where that came from but takes that off them and plops them carefully into that bubble bath and gently massages their back, their shoulders, the top of their head, and carefully washes and cleans them, and takes them out of that bar, and smiles at the strange look on their face as they're soaking wet there, with some bubbles on their forehead and between their ears. and then dries them off with the fluffiest towel that they could ever imagine having. And then sits with them in front of the fire as they warm up and dry off. Before they have some final food to eat, and the human has some final food to eat. And then the human turns off the lights, heading off to bed. And they settle down in their bed. And they comfortably drift asleep. And as they drift asleep, so they dream of pleasant experiences. They dream of wandering along a beach again, enjoying some warmth. And as they walk along this beach, they get distracted by a different smell coming from one of the groups of people sat down, enjoying the setting sun around a campfire on the sand and they decide as they fall asleep perhaps I'll go and wander over and see what these people are like what they enjoy and the closer they get to these people the deeper relaxed they feel and the deeper relaxed they feel the closer they approach those friendly people sat there, enjoying the campfire, listening to the gentle roll of the waves on the shore, as that sun sets, the moon rises, and the stars twinkle overhead, and the little kitten falls deeper and deeper asleep. Just take a moment to allow your eyes to close and allow yourself to begin to relax. And as you begin to relax, I'm just going to tell this sleep meditation in the background. And I don't know whether you'll drift deeper to the sound of my voice or to the spaces between my words. And this sleep meditation is about an ice queen. And she lives in an ice palace 
up in a land of ice. But inside her ice palace, instead of having a doorway out of the palace, she has a giant blue swirling portal and outside in the land around the ice palace there's lots of snow, lots of ice, strong winds whereas inside the ice palace it's calm and quiet. The only sound you hear are the echoing of footsteps while walking around that seem to reverberate down the corridors and up to the top of the palace and back down again. But that portal the Ice Queen can go over to it and can place different crystals into different locations in a device next to the portal. And depending on where she places those crystals, makes it so that the portal directs itself to different locations. And she places a few crystals down into specific holes in that device. The portal starts to whir. And what looks almost like a blue cloud of dry ice or light smoke begins to spiral. And that thick cloud spirals faster and faster. And as it spirals faster and faster, so the whirring becomes more intense. And while that whirring becomes more intense, that spiraling starts to disappear off to a point in the distance beyond the portal. And then when it reaches a certain speed of spinning, that distant point turns to a point of light that gradually as that spinning continues to get faster and faster increases in size with that point of light seeming to get closer and closer until eventually the portal is full of the view of another location and this other location that the Ice Queen can see is of the inside of a wooden building and it's a cosy wooden building in a warm environment and she can feel the warmth coming through that portal and she steps through the portal and steps into that environment and she steps down onto the wooden floorboards in that location she can see the rugs on the floor the cosy sofa comfortable chairs crooked bookcases around the walls holding what look like incredibly old books some leaning at angles, some stacked up, some even facing the wrong way, with the pages facing outwards. And there are some that are upside down. And some that just seem to be placed back as if in a hurry. As if someone just read them and didn't give any care to how they were putting it back on the shelf and as she waited for the person she was meeting here she looked along the bookcases and found herself instinctively 
turning some of the books over, neatening them up, turning some round, placing some together that she thought were related. And then she could smell the sweetest smell of some cooking in the background and the slight chinking sound of cutlery on crockery. And then her host introduced themselves and they walked through and there were a little blue rhino and they're incredibly friendly and they made her some lemonade and the two of them went out of this home and sat on a swinging bench on the balcony just outside the door looking out over a garden and looking out over fields and beyond the fields to what looks like a savannah and then way off in the distance the sun turning the most beautiful orange as it sets and the ice queen had to put on some sunglasses and wasn't used to this kind of heat. And they sat and they talked. And the queen was told that someone is needed for a mission. There's a mission that needs to be gone on, but the queen can't really do it. And they can't do it. But the queen can probably get the person who can. And the queen wondered how and who and was told that the best person to do this job, the person who's best able to find things, is the leprechaun. And together they can summon up that leprechaun. And so they go into the garden and the queen performs a ritual in the garden grey clouds begin to pass across the sky rain starts to fall and as the rain falls so those grey clouds pass by until the angle is just right between the setting sun, the rain clouds and the rain still gently coming down for a rainbow to appear. And the queen then goes to the end of that rainbow to the pot of gold. And with that pot of gold the queen finds the leprechaun and asks that leprechaun for their help. And this was the only way to summon them up and to be able to talk to them. And the leprechaun asks what the problem is. And the queen explains that there's a darkness that's been coming across the land that's been heating up the warm areas and cooling down the cold areas, making them even more extreme. And that it's able to change its shape, control the weather, and seems to be using its magic to make it so that all of the creatures of the land and all the people in the land have to keep themselves indoors 
and find themselves being controlled by that being. But the leprechaun is the only one that's comfortable with hot weather, cold weather, can travel on rainbows and can create its own portals without needing to use crystals or any other devices. And the leprechaun agrees to investigate. They empty out their bucket of gold. They jump in the air. They put their arms beside them, their legs together, and they drop straight into that bucket. And as they do, it's almost like they're on a water shoot. They head down that bucket, whizzing around that shoot, and then springing out in the top of a cloud. and they land on that cloud and behind them is a hat and they pick the hat up off the ground and place their hat on their head and from up here on this cloud they survey the land below trying to look for any signs of darkness or anything unusual and as they look around so they notice something strange. They see a field full of cows. But these cows aren't just brown or black or white or black and white or brown and white. There are cows that look like they've been painted with multiple explosions of paint, with splotches of pink, bright green, red, blue, yellow. And then they notice there seems to be paint looking footprints heading from the field and then suddenly vanishing. As if something had been here and managed to get away. And as they continue looking around, they notice ducks flying en masse. Not just a few ducks, but many ducks. And the leprechaun calls down to those ducks, manages to get one of their attention. And that one duck flies up to the cloud and explains that they're trying to escape that darkness that was behind them and then heads down and continues catching up and flying with the other ducks. So the leprechaun heads the opposite way. And the leprechaun takes his cap off, puts his hand into his cap, and he pulls out this mushroom. He takes a bite out of one corner of it, throws it in the air in a spinning motion. And as it starts falling down through the sky, it seems to get larger and larger. And the gap he bit out gets larger and larger as well. And once it falls below the cloud level, he jumps off the cloud, lands on that mushroom, thumps the side of the mushroom, and then the mushroom starts steering and flying while he continues to chew and eat that bit of mushroom. And just using leaning left, right, backwards and forwards, and the pressure of his hand on the fleshy top of that mushroom. The mushroom accelerates, decelerates, moves left, right, up and down, 
and he flies and he dodges through a sudden hailstorm. He flies up through the clouds to get above that storm. You can see in the distance that darkness. And he continues flying closer and closer. Before the weather seems to calm and relax. And as the weather calms and the wind calms right down. The mushroom flies down to the ground. Gently twists its stalk into the ground. Fixing itself to the ground as it lands. And the leprechaun climbs out of the mushroom. Takes a little bit more to eat before snapping that mushroom off the ground as if he was just picking the mushroom. And as he does so, it shrinks back down to being something just between his thumb and forefinger. He pops it back in his hat and puts his hat back on his head and continues walking in the calmness towards the darkness. And the leprechaun doesn't know what it's going to find, but feels calm and confident that they've got the skill to handle whatever it could be. And as they walk along, they head down into some woodland. They can hear the occasional sound of birds in the woodland. But the birds sound like they sound at night time. Even though, although it's dark, it doesn't feel like night time. And then they come out on to a row of houses with picket fences that look unusually normal and suburban for what seems to be the middle of nowhere. And then they thought they know where they are. They found their way to the middle of nowhere. They thought to themselves they're glad that at least they didn't turn up somewhere. It's even better to sometimes go anywhere than find yourself somewhere. But nowhere is where they wanted to be right now. So they're glad that that's where they are. Because they didn't want to be anywhere or somewhere. And they can see people seemingly in unison mowing their gardens behind those picket fences all just gazing forward almost like robots and they thought there seemed to be something odd about this and they continued on and at the end of the street, the darkness seemed almost like a solid barrier. That it looked like it cut a building in half. They could see under the slight light that there was, the houses and the slight light given off by the houses. And then suddenly there was just darkness almost like looking into inky water. And they took their hat off, reached into their hat, and pulled out a torch. And it was a torch that was a stick with a flame on the end. And the flame was already lit when they took out their hat. And they put the hat back on their head. 
they held their hand out in front of them. And they walked forward into that darkness. And it shimmered, almost like dropping a stone into some water, as they walked through into the darkness. And the other side, they were surprised to encounter delight to find themselves in a very lit up area where they didn't actually need that torch. It was a very white area. And initially they couldn't make anything out. Everything was just white in all directions. There was very little detail. And then gradually they started hearing the sound of seabirds. And then the sound of an ocean. And then could just about make out bright, almost white, with a slight tinge of green grass. As the light here seemed to be uniformly bright, as if coming from everywhere. And they walked towards the sound of the ocean. And as they got nearer to the ocean, so they could see a tree in the middle of what's almost just a field. And they could just about see in the distance that they would be coming to the top of a cliff so they walk past that tree, they continue on to the top of the cliff. They look down and can see down that cliff, all the way down to the seashore. They don't see an easy way down. And they decide to have a look around, see if there's a route down. And as they look around, they notice in the back of the tree seem to be a small door. So they head back to that tree. They open that small door. Notice inside the tree some steps descending. And they walk into that door, close it behind them. And everything goes dark again. And as it goes dark, so they descend those steps. Ten, nine, eight. Seven, that echoing of each footstep as they walk around that spiral staircase down. Six, five, four, three, two, one, finding themselves at the bottom of that staircase and seeing spread before them a tunnel heading towards the shore. And hanging in this tunnel seems to be many glass jars containing blue liquid that's glowing and illuminating the path. And then from the ceiling of the tunnel, there's what looks a bit like some blue fungus. It's like an electric blue colour that's glowing and pulsating. And the blue liquid seems to be dripping from that fungus into those jars. Continually keeping them topped up. And they continue to walk towards the seashore. And when they come out onto the seashore, they notice how incredibly bright it is out here again. And they see a row of rocks leading a little way out into the sea. And they notice that the sea is so calm that it disappears into the whiteness in the distance that you can't tell where the sea ends and the horizon begins. 
almost like a thick fog just a little way off from the shore and the sea being so calm it blends in. And they notice some movement on the rocks and head over to the rocks. And over at the rocks, they see a mermaid just sat there, chilling out and relaxing. And they talk to that mermaid, they explain the mission they're on to deal with the darkness, but they're unsure what the darkness is because in here, the darkness seems light. And the mermaid explains that they've been struggling with the brightness that there's a brightness that's come over the land that seems to have made it so everything is bland. That everything seems very samey. That places that were once hot are now not. Places that were once cold are now just average temperature that everything seems to be settling on one temperature wherever you go and that the brightness takes over the land you don't get to appreciate the colours and all the things you get when there isn't so much light and that it seems to be coming from everywhere not just a bright sun. And the leprechaun asks if they've any idea what might be causing it, because they've headed to the darkness, hoping to find the cause, and now they're in delight. And the mermaid is in the light and has never ventured to the darkness. And the mermaid said that perhaps you can talk to the manatee. And she dives down into the sea. And she barely makes a splosh as she dives down. And a few flicks of her tail. And she's gone. And the leprechaun just sits on that shore appreciating the peace and calm. Takes his hat off while he waits. Takes out a pack of cards. He makes a grid of cards in front of him. Turns over a card. Then the next one, and then turns them back again. Then turns over the third card, and the fourth card and then turns them back again. Then turns over the fifth card, and then the first card, and picks them both up and puts them to one side. And then turns over the next card, and the third card, and then puts them to one side. And just slowly works through, pairing up those cards, before shuffling again, flicking those cards through his fingers, ruffling the cards, splitting the cards, shuffling them some more, and then quickly dealing them out into a grid again, and pairing them all up again. And after three goes of doing that, they hear the faintest splosh as that mermaid arrives back to say that they'd spoken to the manatee and the manatee has heard from other fish, an octopus, and other animals in the sea, that this seems to be a problem up here on the land, that that seems to be where it started, that apparently there was a tree that it started in, And the leprechaun finds out where that tree is. 
thanks that mermaid for their help. And then starts making that journey to the tree. And they head back through that tunnel, ascend the steps, leave that tree. And as they do, they hear some buzzing in the tree, just the faintest buzzing sound. And they notice that high up in the tree is a bee's nest. And they head up, climbing that tree to that beehive. And they look in and they can see the honeycomb pattern there and see those bees so busy working. And they call one of the bees over and they ask if they know where this tree is, if they know the easiest way to find it, given that to them everything's just white and hard to make out. And the bees do a little dance, wriggle their bums, flap their wings a little bit. And the leprechaun understands, descends that tree, and heads left. And they continue left until they encounter something strange. They discover a goggly-eyed, monster-like creature that seems so friendly. It seems to move its head around almost as if it's on a spring. And with each movement of its head bobbing around, so its eyes wibble and wobble almost like loose balls inside the eye sockets. And they watch as this creature just seems to walk around. And they go and approach that creature. And as they do, they notice that the creature is walking around yo-yoing. And they head over and they explain what they're looking for. That they're looking for the tree where this problem began. And they describe the tree. And this monster just starts yo-yoing out in front of them. They make the yo-yo go up and down. Then they make a triangle and they swing the yo-yo through the triangle. And then round and round. And the leprechaun understands the directions being given about where to go forward, where to turn left and right, and where to go around something and head in another direction, and then where to descend. And they take this monster who goes on their way, and they carry on their way. They get up and head left and carry on. And after a while, they feel that the light should have changed, the day should be drawing to an end, and yet there's an even bright light still everywhere, that it's almost like there's an incredibly thick, low-lying fog with bright sunlight somehow shining on the back of that fog like the whole sky and the whole land is turned into one giant light box. And they carry on walking until eventually they see a slight dark shape against the brightness. And they head towards that tree. And when they arrive at that tree, they notice the most unusual thing. They notice that it has incredibly unusual looking leaves and incredibly unusual looking plants growing on its branches. And that it seems to have 
unusual fruit. And there's something very strange about this fruit, because as they're watching, so they notice that the fruit seems to be hatching, and out of each bit of fruit pops a baby dragon. And it pops out of the fruit, grips onto the fruit for a while, eats the bit of fruit that was there, before releasing their grip, dropping towards the ground, flapping their wings and landing on the ground. And beneath this tree are all of these dragons. And there's still dragons coming from the fruit. And the leprechaun looks at how much fruit is still in the tree and realizes that if each bit of fruit is going to turn into a dragon, there's going to be a lot of dragons. And these are all just baby dragons. And they're making a kind of chirping sound as they kind of try and breathe out fire. Rather than actually breathing fire. A slight chirping, squeaking sound. And the leprechaun goes and looks at the different dragons and sees that some are multicolored, some are kind of an oily color where as they move, they change color from slight greens and turquoises to slight blues and reds. Some seem to be scaly, some seem to be smooth. Some are just one colour, like red, or black, or green. And the leprechaun just watches as they all get used to flight, but none of them seem to be going that far from the tree. And they wonder, this is the tree they were directed to, saying that the problems began here. And they thought they were looking for a person or some being that was causing all this. And they wondered what was going on. And then they saw someone in the distance in a purple cloak. They could just about make out that person's purple cloak. And they headed over towards that person. And one of the little dragons potted around their feet. And they had to try and walk around that dragon. It kept on wanting to jump up and almost wanting to just be hugged. But they managed to just pet it gently before saying that I've got to go and talk to the person in purple. And as they arrived at this person in purple, they noticed that this person seemed to be a little distressed. And they asked what the problem was, and they said that they came here for a day out. And as they were here having their day out, they'd been by the beach. They then took a bit of a walk. And then they tripped over. And as they tripped over, their watch broke. And now it just seems to be running backwards. But not only is it running backwards, but it's a magic watch. And so some of the magic dust that was given by the fairy as a gift, as a wedding present many centuries earlier, that they've kept in this watch ever since, has got into the workings of the watch. And so it's messing with time and messing with reality. Because it's not just time that turns backwards. And so it seems to be dividing things into lightness and dark. And merging the different realities. And they've been trying to stop the watch. 
and turn it backwards, but any time they try to blow the fairy dust out, it just goes in their nose, they sneeze a bit, and it seems to just settle back down in the watch. And they've been sat here for ages, and standing up, and stamping around, and getting frustrated trying to find a solution. And the leprechaun thinks maybe I can help. And the leprechaun takes off their hat. And they take a look at that watch. They can hear the inner workings of the watch. The ticking. The moving of the cogs. They hold it in their hand and they can feel the workings of that clock. They can feel the subtle movements the clock makes while it's resting on the palm of their hand. They can see the sparkling, twinkling fairy dust moving around within the cogs, around the clock face. And they very carefully take out what's almost like a sheet from their hat. And they lie it down, but this sheet seems so light, almost lighter than air. And they rest that watch on to that sheet. They then take out some glasses that seem to have glasses built onto the glasses, and then glasses built onto those glasses. And they pop the glasses on the end of their nose. And they look through all those sets of glasses. And they crouch down. And they get the tiniest tools out. And then while that wizard, in his purple robe, is still stamping around and stressed out by it all, the leprechaun just relaxes, calms himself right down and uses his tools in his steady hand to very carefully undo every layer of that watch piece by piece. And as he does, so the light around him begins to fade while that watch begins to stop, as if somehow everything is connected and the sounds begin to stop. And everything seems to take on almost a grey, like a cloudy, stormy day, but without any weather, where there's no longer this bright white or this darkness, just a steady grey in every direction and it makes it slightly harder to see what they're doing. So they allow their eyes to close, and they allow themselves to feel what they're doing. They know what part of the watch they're changing. They know the inner workings of watches. And they can just feel it through the tools feeling their way deep into the workings of that watch until they've taken it to pieces completely. And then they carefully rub every cog and every spring and every bit of the inner workings of that pocket watch on that sheet before carefully placing every piece back again in exactly the right place. And as every piece starts being placed back, so that grey begins to brighten. And the weather begins to turn more normal. 
and it appears more like just an average summer's day. Except that the sun is just beginning to set here. And next to that completed pocket watch, all fixed, is a small pile of fairy dust. And the leprechaun hands back the watch, folds up the fairy dust in the sheet, ties a knot in it, and hands the wizard that sheet containing the fairy dust. And the wizard thanks them for their effort, for what they did, for their ability to keep so calm when so much had been going on around them that they panicked at creating so much change across the land. And the more they panicked, the harder they found it to focus, relax, and make the right choices. And behind you, you notice that under that tree, no more dragons seem to be being born. But the dragons that have been born are still just pottering around as if with nothing to do. And you ask the wizard if they know anything about dragons. And the wizard explains that they need to grow up in a good home. And that ordinarily, just one dragon a generation would be born from a tree like this. And they take a very long time to grow, to be born. And ordinarily, an elder dragon would land and would take on that young dragon because it happens with regularity and would teach that young dragon the ways of being a dragon. But there is no elder dragon here to do that. And the leprechaun says that they know a few friends that might be able to help. And so the leprechaun takes their hat off again. They place it down on the ground. They go and drop one dragon at a time through their hat as the wizard just watches. And then they jump in the air, put their hands by their side, pull their legs in and drop into the hat themselves, heading down through that tunnel, whizzing around in that chute and then popping out behind all those dragons. They then turn around, pick up their hat, place their hat on their head. And then in front of them is a giant cave with a low rumbling sound coming from the cave. And they walk towards that cave and the area around here appears very volcanic. The ground rumbles, has black stone, dark clouds. But this is as it's meant to be here. And then inside the cave, the leprechaun shouts the dragon's name. And with a loud snort, the dragon wakes up. And then sees that leprechaun down there. While they wake up, stand up and tower high over the leprechaun. And the leprechaun explains what's been going on and that it's not the time for them to wake yet. But they need their help. 
And then that dragon looks down and sees all these little baby dragons running towards it. And they all run and tuck themselves in underneath that dragon. As if they suddenly know that this dragon's there to protect them and help them. And as they tuck in, so the leprechaun takes their hat off again, pulls out a tiny box and starts turning the little metal lever on that box as a bedtime tune begins to pluck its way out. And as the leprechaun, with a slight wry smile, twists that lever, so those baby dragons begin to close their eyes, tuck themselves down, and drift and float comfortably and relax to sleep. And the leprechaun says, I'll leave this with you, and leaves that little music box. And the dragon says that they know what to do. They can find homes for these dragons but it means they're going to have to wake up other dragons to do so. There's not normally so many dragons around all at once. The leprechaun thanks them for their help. Before putting his hat back down again, jumping back through it. And then appearing back at that home. meeting with the Ice Queen and the Blue Rhino and explaining to them what went on. And at this point, there was many others who'd made it to the house, who had all come here to try and find out what was going on and if there was any way of solving it. And then they see that it was the Leprechaun who solved it who managed to remove the darkness, who explained that it wasn't really a darkness, that through the darkness was light and was another world experiencing a similar problem only in their world and in their reality. Through that universe, light was taking over, that it's all because of a broken watch but they fixed that watch now. And all the realities are back to normal. And the rhino made up some food. And they all had a large garden party. Before heading off in their different directions, as the sun had set, the moon had risen in the sky. The stars were glistening overhead. Then at the end of the day, the queen went back through that portal, back into her palace, and headed to bed, and settled down, drifting and floating so peacefully and comfortably asleep, knowing that Across all the multiple universes, the world was back as it should be, and drifting and floating so peacefully, so comfortably asleep. Just take a moment to allow your eyes to close and allow yourself to begin to relax. And as you begin to relax, I don't know whether you'll relax deeper to the sound of my voice or whether it'll be to the spaces between my words. And as you begin to comfortably drift asleep, I'm just going to tell this sleep meditation in the background. And it's a sleep meditation about a woman who has had a very long and hard day at work. And she gets home and in the evening, she goes and runs a bath. 
and she fills that bath with plenty of bubbles. And she lights a few candles around the bath. And she can smell the scents in the bathroom and notice the dim flickering lights around the walls of the bathroom. And she can hear that water running into the bath, filling that bath. And notice the steam in the bathroom and the mirror misting up. And then once the bath is full of bubbly, hot water, she gently relaxes herself down into that bath. Rests herself back and relaxes all the way down so that she can feel the water just under her chin. She can feel the bubbles tickling as they touch and pop around her cheeks, around the back of her neck. And she can breathe in the fresh scents in the bathroom. and hear the silence of that bathroom. And as she relaxes there, she allows her eyes to gently close. And she begins to just comfortably drift into her mind, drifting and floating into a pleasant reverie, where she starts to lose track of all time. where she's aware that there's silence, but she's aware that there's a certain sound to the silence, but not a sound that she could pinpoint as hearing, that she would only be able to tell you that there was a sound by its absence if it disappeared. And she allows her mind to wander and as she drifts deeper into that reverie, feeling the warmth of the bar, soothing and relaxing her muscles, soothing and relaxing her neck, her shoulders, her arms, her body, down her legs to her feet, relaxing her breathing, relaxing her heart rate as she drifts deeper and deeper into relaxation. She starts to have this sense in her mind's eye of walking through a forest. The sound of each footstep gently crunching on leaves and twigs pushing through some of the thin, small branches, weaving between the trees, and walking deeper and deeper into this forest, noticing a slight fog hovering just above the ground, and hearing this musical sound off in the distance. A musical rhythm playing and with curiosity walking deeper into this forest towards that sound. And after a while, noticing that the fog is beginning to lift slightly as she approaches a clearing. And as she walks out into that clearing, she sees the strangest of sights. She 
she sees a circle of different creatures. She can see a fox. She can see an owl. A couple of mice. Some squirrels. All standing around in a circle, bobbing up and down. And in the middle of the circle, standing on a stone, on a grey and flat stone, and bopping up and down and dancing around. She can see a gerbil playing maracas and it's dancing around and twirling it's waving its arms in the air and all the other animals are standing around and bopping to that gerbil's music And then all of a sudden, one of those animals notices this woman standing there. And the gerbil drops their maracas. And all the animals start acting like normal. And start scampering off in different directions. As if what she had seen hadn't really been seen. And she walks over to that stone. And she can see that gerbil a little way off now, tucked behind a log, keeping an eye on her. She sits down near that stone, crosses her legs, becomes very still and quiet. And after a few moments, some of the animals poke their heads out and when they see that she isn't moving they start finding their way back and investigating her and that gerbil climbs up onto her leg and she remains motionless. And it looks up at her. And then she looks down towards it. And it flinches back ever so slightly. But then notices that she seems safe to be around. And so it moves forward again. And then she turns one of her hands, palm up. And the gerbil moves over to that hand. And rests against the hand. And she gently strokes that gerbil. And then the others, all those other animals, start getting closer and start gathering around feeling that she seems safe. And then that gerbil goes and picks its maracas up again and starts playing. Only this time it's playing a different rhythm and it's playing in front of this woman and she finds it somehow hypnotic to be listening and watching that gerbil playing those maracas. And she finds her eyes doing a few rapid blinks before relaxing shut. She feels herself do one big breath in and then out. As she drifts even deeper inside her mind.
and while she drifts deeper inside her mind. She starts having that feeling of wind blowing through her hair. And then a scene begins to form around her. Of her traveling along in a car down an incredibly straight road where the road goes off so far in the distance that it reaches to at least the horizon. And she looks out of the window one side and can see the countryside flashing past. And she looks in towards the car, looking the other side. And in the passenger seat, she can see that gerbil with its seat belt on, shaking its maracas to the music on the radio. And it looks over and up at her and smiles, before getting even more invested in its playing. Seeming so invested in the music that it closes its eyes to absorb itself in that music. And she looks back forward and continues to drive. And she doesn't even question the experience about going on a road trip with a gerbil. And as she continues to drive, so the sun begins to set. And eventually they have to set up camp. And she gets out of the car and can see in the back seat is a bag. And she takes that bag off the back seat, finds a tent in the bag. She puts that tent up a little way off the road. She sees the gerbil take a bag and take a tiny tent out of that bag. And she watches as that gerbil puts its tent up next to hers. Then she heads into her tent. Has a torch hanging down in the middle of the tent. And she sits in the entrance to the tent. With a campfire flickering away. And as the last of the sun disappears over the horizon, she can see the stars stretching across the sky. She looks over towards the gerbil, who looks back at her, and she can see it reclining on its back, lying there also looking up towards the sky. And she feels a connection with this gerbil, like they're on this adventure together, even though they have no shared language. She feels that they understand each other. And they both head to bed in the tents for the night. And the next morning, they take the tents down and they continue their drive. And the woman doesn't know where she's going, but she feels that they're supposed to both just be driving until arrival at the destination just feels right. She has this feeling like the gerbil knows 
where they should be heading. And part way through the day, she can see the most incredible clouds on the horizon, towering over the horizon. Almost like there's some kind of a smoke machine bubbling those clouds out. And as she drives, so those clouds get nearer and nearer as she gets nearer and nearer to the clouds until she can see in the distance a wall of rain and as they get closer and closer to that wall of rain she notices the occasional raindrop landing on the windscreen of the car and they make sure all the windows are done up on the car as they head into that rain and there's a the sound of the windscreen wipers flicking left and right, left and right, left and right there's a the sound of that rain on the roof of the car, on the bonnet on the rear of the car on the windscreen, on the windows. And as that rain gets heavier and heavier, so the woman decides to pull over at the side of the road and to stop for a while as visibility almost totally disappears. And she reclines her seat and closes her eyes and decides to just relax to the sound of the rain. And the gerbil just tucks itself down on the passenger seat and relaxes with the woman to the sound of that rain. The woman wonders whether she's fallen asleep at points. When she starts to notice some hints of sunlight. And starts to hear some distant sounds of birds. Sounds of birds that are almost chirping to celebrate the end of the rain. And then she notices off in the opposite direction to the sun, the most incredible, vivid rainbow. And then continues her journey. And just as nightfall is setting in again, the gerbil changes its behavior as if to suggest that they're arriving at their destination. And the woman seems a turning off into a forest. The gerbil seems to be looking in that direction, so the woman takes that turning, heads down a dirt track into the forest. Bumping through that mud, before arriving at a cabin deep in this forest. And the gerbil unbuckles its seatbelt, exits the car, heads into the cabin, and the woman follows. And on the floor, Near the fire is a tiny little bed and the fire is alight. 
and that gerbil places its bag down near that bed and sits on the bed. The woman comes in and places her bag down near a chair and sits down in the chair. And while sat down, she has a little look around. She wonders if there's anyone else here. And then she sees someone coming down some stairs, smiling, holding a hand out to greet her. She shakes hands with them as they then head through to the kitchen and then walk through a door. And a moment later, she sees that person walk in through the back door and greet her. And she thinks, I've just greeted you. And then she sees the other person come back through again and realizes that these are twins. but there seems to be something different about them. And as they sit down and begin to talk to her, almost as if they both know what each other are thinking and saying. Almost like they have shared thoughts, like their sentences come from both of them as if they're both one person. And the two of them smile and are friendly. And they share about how this gerbil has led her here. And that the gerbil and this woman will be heading out into the forest in the morning. But for now, they're here in this cabin. And then those twins lift up one hand each. They gently touch the palms of that hand together. And as they do, a white light begins to form around their hand, begins to spread out across both of their arms around their bodies until they're both totally contained within a glowing white light. And as that white light begins to fade, there's only one being stood there and this being doesn't look like either of the twins. And they don't explain who they are and how they were as twins or why. But as this single being they hand the woman a single stone and it's a very flat very smooth grey stone and then they get surrounded by white light again. And as that white light clears, they're back to being the two twins, sat there as if nothing had happened, carrying on the conversation. And one of those twins says, I'll go and make up the bed for you. They head upstairs 
they make up that bed. The gerbil will sleep downstairs in front of the fire. And after eating, they head up to bed, curious about what the next day will bring. And the next morning, they wake up early and head off out of the cabin with that gerbil. And the gerbil leading the way leads them deep into the forest until they eventually find a stream and they follow that gently rippling, bubbling stream to a lake. And this lake is incredibly calm with just the smallest of ripples. And the gerbil seems to be excited, jumping up and down and trying to draw attention to something. And they realize that that gerbil is drawing attention to something that's sticking out of the water. And it's sticking out of the water quite a long way away. And then the gerbil's making gestures as if it's suggesting to throw something. And so the woman takes that stone out of her pocket and asks, do you want me to throw this? And the gerbil seems to gesture as if to say yes, but is gesturing as if to say, but you need to hit that thing out there. And the woman isn't sure if she's going to be able to do it. And so she picks up some other stones first. She practices throwing those stones, skimming them to help them to travel further, to be able to hit the right mark. And once she was confident that she could do this, she took that stone, got down low over the water, and then launched that stone across the top of the water. And as it grazed the top of the water, she could see white sparkles coming from where it struck the water, almost seeming to propel it faster. And each time it struck the water, even more white sparkles appeared around that stone. Until eventually, after about 10 bounces, it struck the target. And as it struck the target, so she could suddenly hear a rumble. And then could see the center of the lake beginning to move, the water beginning to rise up, and a wave beginning to travel towards the shore. And then something broke the surface And the water was pouring down the sides, pouring off the top. And there was a lot of mist of water. And that mist was catching a lot of the light, that low morning light. And making it very difficult to make out exactly what this was. And then, once the rumbling stopped, 
and whatever that was that came up from the water had stopped moving. She noticed that it looked like a statue of something. And she didn't know its significance. She didn't know whether she had to get to it. And if she had to get to it, couldn't she have just gone over to it and pressed that point instead of throwing a stone at it? And then she noticed that there was something swimming in this lake. And saw that whatever had just happened seemed to have released some large manta rays into this lake, almost looking like shadows just under the surface. And she saw as one started heading over towards her and the gerbil. And as it got over near the shore, she recognized how large it was compared to her. And while she was so busy watching that manta ray swimming to the shore, she hadn't even noticed that the gerbil had changed into diving gear, including a tiny little helmet and some breathing apparatus. And by the time it got near the shore, that gerbil was already trying to run into the water and swim out to it. And she realized that in the bag that she had brought along, was a tiny device she could pop in her mouth that would allow her to breathe underwater. So she took that device, popped it in her mouth, and walked into that cool water of the lake and followed the gerbil to that manta ray. And the gerbil seemed to hold onto the back of the manta ray. And she joined it holding onto the back, before that manta ray then began to descend into the darkness of the lake. And as it descended deeper and deeper, while swimming back in the direction of that statue, she noticed how much silt was down here in this lake and had been moved by what had just happened and how this lake now almost took on a chocolatey colour that was very difficult to see through. And as they reached the point where that statue had risen up, she noticed that it seemed to have opened up a passage and the manta ray dived down into the passage. And as it went deeper and deeper, so the woman had to make her ears pop a few times to remain comfortable while diving even deeper. And then diving through a passage before the manta ray stopped swimming and the woman realized that just above her head she could notice waves. She popped her head up and realized that she was in an underground chamber. And as her and the gerbil walked up into this chamber it automatically sprung into light. And she noticed the scale of this chamber. And inside this chamber 
was the most beautiful blue lagoon. with water that was almost electric blue in colour. And the sound was so peaceful and echoing down here. And she followed that gerbil to the blue lagoon. And the gerbil walked around the edge of that blue water and she followed it walking around that edge and they arrived at a small rowboat the gerbil jumped up and in and she jumped in and she rowed out into the lagoon following the instructions of this gerbil And she could sense the gerbil wanted her to stop when she was in the middle of the lagoon. And so she did. And as she stopped, that rowboat just bobbed gently up and down. The gerbil got out its maracas and started creating a rhythm. And the woman thought to herself, this probably isn't the time or place. But as it created that rhythm, she noticed movement from the top of the cave. Slight blue light moving, like thousands of particles of light moving from the top of that cave. and seeming to flicker. And then after a few moments, she realized that she was now in a cave full of electric blue butterflies flying around her, with some blue sparkling coming out the back and off the wings of each butterfly. And she watched as they seemed to dance around her and the gerbil. And then out of the center, a tube started lowering down. And contained in that tube was a scroll. And she took that scroll out of the tube she opened that scroll up and was surprised to realize that somehow she instinctively knew what it said and she knew that she didn't recognize the language but she somehow just from doing her best to read it she could understand it and she realized that it was teaching about the illusion of time, about the ability to slow time right down so much that a moment can last a lifetime. It talked about being able to speed time right up. So a whole lifetime could pass in a moment. And how it could help you take a grasp of time. Help you be in control of time. Help you become a being that can transcend time. And the gerbil climbed up onto the woman's leg and read this scroll with her. And although she couldn't understand the gerbil, the gerbil couldn't understand her, 
the two of them could understand this scroll. And she knew that somehow the knowledge from the scroll was becoming a part of who she is. Then the gerbil communicated to her to place that scroll back, that they've got their learning, they've come here for this knowledge, and she places that scroll back, and they row back across that blue lagoon. Those butterflies head back up to the top of this cave. And they find their way back to that cabin. And back at the cabin, they meet the twins. And the twins ask if they found what they came looking for. And the gerbil just climbs into bed. And the woman says that she thinks they did. And then that night, the woman heads to bed. And the next morning, they leave this cabin. The woman's still curious about those twins who can become a single being. And whether the single being is the main being or whether the twins are the main being and what is going on with them. She's aware that they looked incredibly similar, but there were subtle differences in the way they communicated. Almost like they're two sides of a coin. And she continued her road trip back the way she came. And at some point during the road trip, she found herself sat in that forest, surrounded by those woodland animals. Now, with a deer leaning over her. And they seemed so curious about her. And that gerbil started walking off into an area of the forest. The woman instinctively followed that gerbil. And she followed it through the forest, out to a clearing, where she saw the most incredible sight. She was looking over a field of sunflowers that stretched in every direction, all the way to the horizon, all the way off as far as she could see to the left, to the right. And she could see as that sun was setting over this sunflower field. And the gerbil climbed up one of the sunflowers to get a better look. And as that sun completely set over the horizon and the moon started shining in the sky, she had a sense of everything fading away, of smelling the scents in that bathroom of feeling that tickling of the bubble bath and the warmth of the water and hearing the relaxing sound, the relaxing silence of the bathroom and opening her eyes in that bath, 
feeling so deeply relaxed. And then beginning to think about the experience. And as she thought about the experience she just had, which she imagined was just a reverie, she had this feeling like somehow time was slowing down, like the flickering candles had more space between each flicker. And she moved one leg under the water. And she could see the way that moved the water, the way the bubbles bobbed up and down. And as she thought about time slowing, down, she noticed that the bobbing waves in the bath seemed to slow right down. But she couldn't work out for sure whether that was a real thing, whether the waves really were slowing, or whether the water just happened to move at that speed. And after her bath, she wrapped up warm in a dressing gown. She sat outside on a bench, looking out over her back garden. And she could see some fireflies flying between some trees at the end of her garden. She had this sense of slowing time down and noticed those fireflies become motionless at the end of the garden. And while she held on to that focus in her mind, she stood up and started walking towards those fireflies and realized that as long as she held her focus, they remained motionless. And then she had a sense of them moving faster. And while she watched those fireflies dancing and darting around, out of her peripheral vision, she suddenly noticed something else. The way the stars began spinning across the sky. And she stepped back a few paces and looked up at the sky while focusing on time going past quickly and could see those stars rapidly moving across the sky and realized that what she thought was just a reverie was more than just a reverie. And then she heard a noise and turned around and saw something scampering off. And she headed back to her back door. And on the ground at her back door was a little grey stone. And she picked that grey stone up. She could feel how smooth that stone was between her fingers. How smooth it was touching the palm of her hand. She headed into her home, closed the back door behind her, and sat comfortably down. And while she sat comfortably down, she focused on that stone almost drifting into a meditation, thinking about the stone, thinking about her experience, wondering 
whether that was the gerbil that just came to her back door. Wondering who that gerbil was and where they are now and imagining in her mind's eye that they perhaps have gone off on another adventure, maybe with their backpack on, a little hat on, maybe to play music elsewhere. And that night, she headed to bed, still thinking about the experience, still trying to process this new learning about time and how time isn't a fixed thing, but is relative and can change depending on your perception. And as she thought about that, so she began to drift and float so comfortably and so peacefully asleep. So as you take a moment to allow your eyes to close and allow yourself to begin to relax, you can listen along to this sleep meditation in the background. And as you listen along, I don't know whether you'll drift asleep faster to the sound of my voice or to the spaces between my words. And as you begin to comfortably drift asleep, I'm just gonna tell this sleep meditation in the background. And it's about a man who's going out on a trek and he's trekking through a jungle heading to the mountains and as he treks through the jungle so he is hacking his way through he can hear the sounds of birds around him hear the rustling of the leaves of the trees and he's aware that high up in the canopy there's a light shower falling on those leaves and he can hear that pitter patter of the rain and the occasional drop of rain that makes its way through the canopy to the ground below. And as he walks deeper through the jungle hearing the sound of his footsteps against the ground he thinks about the journey that he's on, trekking through this jungle to the foot of the mountains, to go in search of treasure in a cave up in the mountains. And he's unsure what he'll find, whether that treasure will still be there. But as an explorer, he's excited to find out. And as the day wears on, so he begins to wear out and he decides to stop and just take some time to camp for the night. And he ties a tent between some trees and sets up a tent that hangs between those trees climbs up a rope ladder into the tent and in the center of this tent is a space for a campfire and so he lights a campfire and the smoke rises up from that campfire up through a hole in the center of the tent and he sits keeping dry at the side of the tent and there's a slight sway to the tent as it rests in those trees. He cooks himself some food, can smell that food cooking, can hear the slight crackling of the campfire. 
and after eating, he puts out that fire, covers that over, and settles down and drifts comfortably asleep. And the next day he awakens feeling so refreshed and invigorated to the sounds of the jungle. He climbs down from the tent, packs that tent away and continues his journey. And after a long while, he can begin to hear the distant flowing of a river and he heads towards that flowing river, arrives at the river, can smell that water from the spray from the river, can see how fast that river is flowing past through this jungle. And he begins to follow the edge of the river, heading upstream towards the mountains. And he can see the mountains that the river has traveled down before heading into the jungle. And he arrives at the foot of those mountains and begins to ascend. And at first the ascent is difficult, ascending through trees. But then after a while the trees begin to thin out. And then he's just ascending over dry ground. But as he gets higher and higher, so the air cools down. He finds himself climbing through snow. And he continues on climbing higher and higher. He can see the clouds hanging low over the jungle. He continues to climb higher and higher up. And he can notice what looks like the cave off in the distance high up in the mountains. And so he pushes on, crunching through the snow, feeling that bracing breeze against his face, feeling the warmth of his body as he climbs that mountain. And after almost a whole day of trekking through the jungle, climbing that mountain, he finally arrives at the cave. And as he enters the cave, so the wind dies down. And you can hear the slight whistling of that wind as it passes the entrance to the cave. And the first thing he does is relaxes down in that cave, puts his backpack down, sets up a campfire near the entrance, lights that campfire, takes some layers off, and relaxes to the warmth of the campfire, and has something to eat. And he gazes out of that cave, over the setting sun, over the clouds below. Thinking about how far he's come. And he can hear the crackling fire and see the way that the firelight and shadows dance on the wall. And you can hear the sound echoing deep into the cave and reverberating back out again. And after having something to eat and having rested, he puts out that fire, preparing to set off deeper into the cave. He puts his backpack back on he turns on a torch hanging on his jacket and begins to walk into the cave. 
and as he walks into the cave, so he can hear the occasional distant drip of water. And he notices that it's warmer in the cave than it is outside on the edge of the mountain. And the cave walls are rough and damp. But after a while of following this one long cave tunnel, he notices something strange. He notices that there appears to be a doorway that looks almost metallic. But as he touches it with his fingers, he can feel that it's got a slight rubbery feel to it. He can't explain the rubbery feel or why this door is here. But he's curious what's the other side of the door. And he feels around that door trying to find a way in and he taps on the door and he can't work out what's behind the door but then all of a sudden as he's tapping on that door with both hands in different places he taps in such a way that the door seems to open. He doesn't know exactly what it is that he did to make that door open, but the door slides open. And as he walks in, so light flickers on. And he finds himself in what looks like an illuminated steel corridor. And he follows that corridor walking deeper and deeper into this cave. He can hear his footsteps echoing like footsteps on steel. And then he sees that there appears to be rooms off of this corridor. But he decides to continue on to explore whatever the big room is that looks like it's in front of him. And as he arrives at that big room, so he notices that it looks like there are panels with screens. And as he touches one of them, so they all come to life and suddenly resemble buttons. And he jumps back slightly as everything seems to come to life around him. And then he can see on a monitor that looks like it's a window, the inside of the cave that this thing is in. And he realizes that he's walked onto a spaceship that seems to be embedded within this mountain. He doesn't know how large this spaceship is or how long this spaceship has been here. He imagines it must have been here a long time to somehow be inside the mountain. He sees on that screen, overlaid over the image out of that screen, of the inside of the cave, what looks like dots and larger circles and lines. And over on one of the panels, he can see a green flashing dot and he walks over to that panel. He presses that green flashing dot and as he does, so he can feel shaking and he clings on while the ship shakes. And then he hears a thud and can see daylight in the monitor. And then within seconds of seeing daylight, 
you can see what looks like the earth on that monitor. And he realizes that somehow he's launched this ship out of that mountain and into outer space. And on the monitor, you can see what looks like a route mapped out as if somehow pressing that green button had given permission for this ship to travel to a destination, almost like setting in coordinates into a sat-nav and giving an automatic car permission to follow the route to the destination in the sat-nav. And while the ship flies, following whatever its route is to whatever the destination is, the man is a little uncertain what's going to happen, but decides now's a good time to quickly go and check those other rooms, see if he can learn anything about the experience. And so he goes into the first room, and it looks like sleeping quarters. He goes into another room and it looks like an area for lounging around and relaxing. In another room, it looks like somewhere people eat. And he can't see any clues as to who the people were. And he can't seem to find any documents. It seems like somehow this spacecraft was abandoned entirely empty as if it was cleared out when it was abandoned and he goes back to the main control room the room he decides to think of as the bridge of the ship and he's surprised at how fast it seems to be traveling He can see on the map on the screen that it looks like they're already nearly halfway to their destination. And yet it feels like they've only just left the Earth. And he can't seem to work any of the controls. So all he can do is sit back and wait and see where this ship is going and after a while he notices that one of the stars is getting brighter and brighter closer and closer in the screen and he can see on the map on the screen they're getting closer and closer to a star system that's got some planets circling it And as it gets closer and closer, it eventually starts to go into an orbit around that star before arriving at one of the planets, circling one of the planets, and then slows down and heads down towards that planet. And it seems to be on an autopilot to landing. And as it heads down, so the man notices that there seems to be lots of craft in the sky. Craft heading off into space. Craft flying around tall buildings. And this planet looked very Earth-like, but as if it was Earth in the future and then the craft found an area settled itself down and landed and the man didn't know what to expect he heard the door opening he heard footsteps walking down the corridor he could hear talking 
and it all sounded familiar. And yet, he couldn't understand it. And then after a few moments, tall humanoids walked onto the bridge and the man was aghast and didn't know what to say. He then introduced himself and said what he was doing and said that he'd somehow accidentally discovered this ship and accidentally set it off on a course back to this planet. And after just a few moments of him talking, these humanoids began talking back in a way that he could understand. They explained that they can grasp and interpret languages and reply in languages because of a chip embedded in the back of their neck that's connected to their nervous system and connected to a network of deep information and to computers that are incredibly advanced. And they explained this ship had travelled out into the galaxy thousands of years earlier and that many ships had travelled out into the galaxy thousands of years earlier and they'd gone to explore planets which looked like they would be able to have life develop and the idea was that these aliens would monitor that life and the ship that found its way to earth had just never returned and that they were going to send another ship to try to find what had happened to that ship. But then they received a signal saying that there was no need to send another ship. Everything's perfectly fine. But that the aliens on that ship had decided to stay on Earth. Had decided to monitor the cultures monitor the creatures on the planet and see how they developed over time. They'd explained that they had been noticed by the creatures on the planet. They'd been noticed by the humans and that the humans had started treating them almost like gods. And so they felt that by staying they'd be able to demonstrate that they're not gods, that they're mortal beings that live, age, and then die, and that they would be able to monitor these humans, record information about the humans, and that one day in the future, maybe the ship will get collected and they would set in a return course so that if at any point it was necessary that ship could run on autopilot back to where it came from and that it would contain the information they'd learned and the man explained that he hadn't found any information he'd searched the different rooms he couldn't find any evidence at all of who had been on this ship. And the aliens walked over to one of the consoles. They slid some of the sliders on the touch screens. They pressed a few buttons. And then on the main viewer, documents appeared in a language with symbols that the man couldn't understand. With a couple more presses, those documents translated into English and the man was able to see all these records about how these aliens had tried to integrate themselves into the culture in the area 
and they'd still been treated as if they were like gods. They were treated as being almost like giants because they were a few feet taller than the humans in the area. And they lived longer than the humans in the area. But they did age. And they tried to fit in with society. They tried to demonstrate that they were aging. And they kept their technology hidden. They kept their technological knowledge hidden. And every week, they would make the trek up the mountain. They would add more of that information to the records on the ship. until eventually they stopped travelling up that mountain and they stopped adding records. And the man was curious to see that there were some videos that were taken from afar. And after seeing these records, the man was curious what had happened. He said that He'd gone hunting in the jungle for treasure. That he'd heard stories about the culture and stories that the gods there had hidden a treasure in a cave in the mountain. And he assumed that it was going to be perhaps gold or something else precious. He didn't realise that perhaps the locals had been talking about a spaceship buried deep inside the mountain. And the aliens were curious to hear his tale, just as he was curious to tell it, to try and fill in the blanks about how those aliens on Earth had been perceived how this had become mythology in the area. How the aliens, travelling up to the mountains, to that cave every week, obviously got the interest of the civilization living there. And although they never went up to the mountain, while the aliens were around, They were curious, watching these aliens every week climb that mountain and go into that cave. And then somehow, that civilization must have found its way up to the cave and found a door it couldn't open. And perhaps assumed that there was some treasure there, that it was something so important and then that civilization died out. And just the myths were left behind. And the man wondered how he was going to get back home. And the aliens said it doesn't take long in our ships. That they will travel in this ship back to Earth. And they'll drop him off and then bring their ship back with them. And they launched that ship. They said that they couldn't allow him to roam around their planet to see any other technology. That one thing they'd learned was that it's not helpful to give someone a huge technological boost that any species that suddenly gets a huge technological boost well beyond their years struggles to cope with it. It can cause an imbalance of power on societies. And so they generally prefer to just observe and try not to interfere in the natural course of things. 
that if they think they can save people, they'll potentially save people. But they do what they can, as far as possible, not to interfere. And not to suddenly give people technology well above where they're at. And that from looking at this man, they can see that they're still well away from the type of technology that they're using. But that they've made advances since the days that these aliens had arrived on Earth. And so the aliens launched that spacecraft, left the planet, travelled rapidly back to the Earth and landed that spacecraft back down in the space left in that mountain and the very peak of the mountain was missing where the spacecraft had launched out of it and they let the man out of the craft he didn't know what he was going to be able to have to show for his experience. They hadn't given him anything. He hadn't got any photos. No one would believe him. And he walked off of that spacecraft. He watched as in almost a blink, it disappeared from view from that cave space. And he noticed over in one of the corners, in this cave space, which was now open to the sky above, seemed to be a large pile of golden coins and other precious stones and metals and ornaments. And he went over to that. He took a look at those coins to look at the other items that were there and he saw that it looked like there was a gap like maybe people knew something was here that perhaps the civilization had been climbing the mountain after the aliens had died and they couldn't get into the alien ship but had found that there was a hole in the mountain and so the cave wasn't the right place to head for the treasure but round the side of the mountain beyond the cave was on the outside of the mountain what looked almost like a small stone shrine with a hole behind it and that hole led down into the cave below and that they had been throwing offerings down into that cave perhaps for hundreds of years until that civilization had passed and the man gathered up many different coins, ornaments precious stones he took some photos of the shrine before heading back down that mountain following that river camping another night in that jungle before leaving the next day and making his journey home taking with him this treasure knowing that He'll probably just write it up as being treasure from offerings to gods and will probably not say anything about his alien encounter. And once home, he writes up a paper about his experience, about his journey, about the treasures that he found. He prints that off, places it down next to his computer 
heads to bed, drifts and floats comfortably and peacefully, asleep. Okay, just take a moment to allow your eyes to close and allow yourself to begin to relax. And as you begin to relax, I don't know whether you'll drift asleep faster to the sound of my voice or to the spaces between my words. And as you drift comfortably asleep, I'm just going to tell this sleep meditation in the background. This meditation is about a young girl and she's sitting at home and she's reading a book and while she's sitting at home reading a book she's allowing herself to become deeply absorbed in the story and as she reads that book she can hear some background sounds of her parents pottering around She can hear some sounds from outside. She can feel the warmth of the fire. And yet her mind is drawn into that story. But after a little while, something begins to take her out of the story slightly. Every now and then, she hears this meow and at first she doesn't really pay it much attention but then after a few meows she decides to put a bookmark in her book close her book and go and investigate and she goes towards the sound of that meow and she sees outside in the back garden this tiny little kitten and she opens the back door and she lets that little kitten in and the little kitten walks in through the back door and comfortably and confidently seems to walk itself all the way through to the main living area where it settles down on the rug in front of the fire and the girl closes the back door follows after that kitten and sits down next to the kitten on the floor and once that girl sits down next to that kitten so the kitten climbs up on her lap curls around a few times and settles down, sinking itself comfortably into her lap. And she begins to stroke that kitten, and that kitten begins to purr. And she's curious where this kitten came from. The kitten doesn't seem to have a collar or any identification. And as she strokes that kitten, so she wonders about how that kitten got there and why this kitten seems to be so trusting of her even though the kitten doesn't know her and as she strokes that kitten she can feel the purring of that kitten and she almost has this sense of herself and that purring kitten falling into sync with each other and as they fall into sync their breathing starts to synchronize the girl begins to drift and float comfortably into a reverie she starts to drift into her own mind And while she drifts into her own mind, she finds that she's walking through some woodland. And she notices that she's all grown up. And that up on her shoulder is a cat. And the cat looks a lot 
like a grown-up version of that kitten. And the experience feels so real to her, despite the fact that she knows that it isn't real. And she walks through the woods, hearing the rustling leaves overhead, noticing the way shards of light shining down through the trees glistens and dances on the path ahead. The occasional sound of animals moving around in the woods and she continues through that woodland and she can see that off ahead it gets lighter and lighter as the woodland comes to an end. And so she continues walking towards that lighter area. And as she exits the woodland, she's surprised to see that this whole area out here looks like a dusty wasteland, that the wind is whipping up that dust into small clouds of dust that spread out, disperse into small twisters of dust, little dust devils dancing across this barren landscape. And the girl is curious where this place is. She looks behind her and she can see the lush woodland. But out this side of the woodland is this harsh, dusty looking landscape. And she walks down through this landscape, finds her way down to some ruins. It looks like it used to be an old village. And she searches through those ruins. She finds an old suitcase buried in the dust. She uses her hand to wipe off the dust. She opens that suitcase with a click and a creak. And inside the suitcase, she finds a map. And she takes that map from the suitcase and sees on that map that it seems to show this location as it once was. And it shows that not far, just over the hills and around the corner, you can find your way to a seafront. And so she follows that map. She can feel that warmth of the sun on her face. And she heads down towards that seafront. And down at the seafront, she can smell that salty air, hear the sound of those waves rolling in onto the shore, and can hear some seabirds flying overhead. And down here, she notices that there's a cave in the cliff and inside that cave she sees what looked like two old-fashioned diving suits. And there's something strange about one of them, but there's something even more strange about the fact that these diving suits happen to be here. And she wonders whether this is some crazy kind of thought. That there could be diving suits placed here specifically for her and her cat, even though she's never been here before. And the cat jumps down off her shoulder and it starts to climb itself into that old fashioned diving suit. and it gets all its paws into that suit. And the girl, as this grown-up woman, 
does up the back of the diving suit and then places the diving bell helmet on top of that diving suit and sees that cat inside that tiny diving suit. She then climbs into the other diving suit, struggles to get that suit done up, places the bell helmet onto this diving suit, attaches tubes to those suits, and then goes to what looks a bit like a generator that supplies air to those suits and has to pull on a cord over and over again to get that generator started and once it starts whirring she can feel the coolness of the air pumping in and flowing out of this suit and she carries the cat with her as they walk towards that sea and she starts walking into the sea she can feel the pressure of the water on the outside of the suit yet she's totally dry inside the suit and she can feel that pressure of that water rising up her ankles her calf muscles up to her thighs her stomach and after it's passed her stomach she puts the cat down into the water and the cat lowers down under the water and within a few paces she's just putting her head under the water and she continues walking from the shore into the ocean and as she walks from the shore into the ocean she can see the way the sunlight is shimmering and shining through the water above the way the waves are gently undulating overhead and the ripples on the surface and the way light is dancing through that water illuminating the ocean floor and illuminating a wreck not that far in the distance and she heads down towards that wreck with the cat and the cat is swimming along with its four paws inside that diving suit and they head all the way to that wreck and in the wreck the girl finds a chest and she drags that chest out of the wreck ready to take back with her when she goes back to the shore but first she explores the wreck to try and work out what's happened here and she can notice that it looks like there are scorch marks on this boat she can notice the way certain bits of wood are broken to see that something had obviously struck this and a fire had started on this boat and she couldn't see signs of any lifeboats being with this wreck and she was curious whether people made it off this boat safely and for whatever reason never came back for the treasure And after exploring this wreck and watching as fish were swimming through the windows and seeing crabs hiding under plates and other sea creatures down here and seaweed floating past and feeling that sense of peace and calm that comes with the way time seems to slow right down under water. She started her journey back to the shore and she dragged that chest through the water 
until eventually she was walking up towards the shore. She could see the way the water was flowing in and onto the shore. And then her head broke through the surface of the water and she instantly noticed the weight of her head and then of her shoulders and her arms and her body and then of that chest she was pulling from the water and she helped that cat out of the water as well as the cat climbed up onto the chest to be pulled out of the water and up on the land she removed her diving helmet she removed the diving helmet of the cat she undid the cat's suit and the cat climbed out and then she freed herself from her suit and the sun was beginning to set so she lit the campfire on the beach created a makeshift tent out of leaves and wood and the cat and the girl sat and watched as that sun began to set and while that sun was setting so the sky turned the most beautiful blood red and as that sky turned that red and the moon rose as the sun lowered over the horizon she decided to open this chest and she looked at that lock and she worked out how to pick the lock she carefully listened and carefully felt with her fingers while maneuvering a tiny piece of metal inside the lock to feel for the way the inside of that lock moved and she managed to pop open the lock open that chest with a creak and inside the chest she was surprised to find that there was just a sheet of paper and this sheet of paper looked like a very long sheet of paper that was folded up and on the sheet of paper were some dotted lines and a little note saying tear here and so she tore along those dotted lines carefully and then she held on to both sides of that paper and carefully pulled it apart and found that that paper made a string of paper people and she felt a bit bitter about going to all this effort for a sheet of paper that made people and yet this chest was so heavy to carry here and as the campfire continued burning she was curious about what this all meant she was gazing at that chest when clouds started rolling in it started raining and the rain started to damp out the campfire and the girl and the cat tucked themselves away out of the rain into their little camp and the girl continued to stare at that chest curious about why it just seemed to contain that sheet of paper and she looked at the paper and she looked at the people on that paper she tried to work it out and as the rain increased so looking out from the tent appeared more hazy and harder to see over to the chest 
and that chest was beginning to fill with water. And then after a while, she drifted asleep, and the cat drifted asleep, unable to solve the problem of this chest. And in the next morning, after sleeping and dreaming, she went over to that chest, the sun was rising, it was a beautiful clear day. All the rain was drying up, and yet the chest was full of water. And she tipped up that chest, tipping the inside out, emptying that water out of the chest. And as she did, so she was surprised that the bottom of the chest fell out as well. And underneath the false bottom that was in this chest, she found a little leather pouch. And inside that leather pouch were some gold coins with symbols printed on them. And they'd managed to remain dry underneath that false base of this chest. And with it was a note. And the note said that the paper was shaped by this person's son. And that they had hoped that their father would treasure it for always. And so to them, the real treasure in that chest was the paper. And that they had promised their son that they wouldn't make those paper people alone. That they would only make those paper people when they're reunited after the voyage when they can make the paper people with their son. And so it was important to them to keep those paper people safe in that chest. And in this pouch is all the money they have. And it's not a lot, but it's all they have. And the girl then appreciated that paper more so and appreciated the story behind this chest and realized that there was only one important thing about this and that's the connection with others the love between people being able to say yes that's what I'll do I won't complete this until we're reunited and can do this together. And just as the girl reaches this point in this reverie, so the reverie begins to fade. And she finds herself sat back in front of the fire with that kitten resting on her lap, purring away. And she feels a certain sense of connection with the experience she's just had. And then she hears another meowing. And the kitten jumps down off her lap. And runs back to the back door. And she opens the door and outside the back door is a larger cat. And the kitten runs up to that cat rubs itself against the cat. That other cat then seems to lead the kitten away carefully and seems to lead the kitten from their garden and through into another garden. And the girl recognized that other cat as being the next door neighbor's cat. And the next door neighbor's cat must have had kittens quite recently. 
and the girl was fascinated with the reverie that she'd had. And so she sat back down in front of the fire, but instead of reading this time, she got out her notebook and she started telling a story of this female adventurer and her cat going exploring and treasure hunting. And she told her parents about her stories that she was writing about this female hero and her cat. And together, they were going to go on so many adventures. And that night, after she was tucked in, while she was drifting asleep, she drifted and floated so comfortably into pleasant dreams and stories she knew she could write and tell in the future. And she relaxed and floated so peacefully, so comfortably asleep. So just take a moment to allow your eyes to close and allow yourself to begin to relax. And as you begin to relax, so I'm just going to tell the sleep meditation in the background. And I don't know whether you'll drift asleep faster to the sound of my voice or whether it'll be to the spaces between my words. And as you continue to drift asleep, you can listen along to this meditation in the background. And it's a meditation about a couple who are celebrating their 25 year wedding anniversary. And as a celebration, they'd always wanted to go on a train journey the train journey takes them through mountains. It takes them through long, open plains. And it takes them all the way to a distant coast. And they've always wanted to make this long train journey. And the train that the journey is on is a special train. It's one of the rare times that a steam train makes this journey. And so for the journey, they can hear the of the steam train. They can hear the whistle as the steam train heads into tunnels, cutting through mountains. As the steam train passes by different spaces and stations, they can smell that smoke as it pumps along the side of the carriages. And the carriages are done up nicely with lace net curtains over the windows. With a table between the seats where they can enjoy fine dining. And those making this journey get their own section of carriage to sleep in, like their own little compartment. And this couple set off from an ordinary station. And they have a sense of excitement, of wonder of what the journey is going to entail. And as that train gets going, So they look out the window and they can see the landscape changing. They can see distant mountains getting closer and closer, feeling the rocking of that train on the track as it accelerates. They sit and drink a cup of tea with each other, sharing that experience. And as they begin to head to the mountains, so that train begins to ascend and pass through tunnels through the mountains, those tunnels getting longer and longer. And they can look down over grasslands and meadows, they can see deer 
and other animals down there. They can see bird of prey flying in the sky, hovering overhead. Noticing the way the sun glistens on the snowy mountains and shimmers on the grass in the fields. And this journey doesn't pull into very many stations. Most of it is traveling through scenery, just enjoying the views with set meals at certain times. And by the end of the first day, as the sun is setting, so that train is now traveling around the outsides of a large mountain range. As they look out the window, they can see the sunset in one direction and the twinkling stars appearing in the other direction. As they continue to head towards those twinkling stars, so the sun sinks further behind the horizon. And after a while, they decide to settle down for the night. And so they head back to their cabin. They snuggle up in the bed and in a loving embrace. They drift and flow to sleep. And while they drift asleep, one of them begins to dream. He dreams about his wedding day, dreams about looking out over the wedding venue, seeing all of his friends and family, seeing all of his partner's friends and family. And then that emotional moment where he sees his partner walking down the aisle, his dad walking along with him, walking him to the front, standing side by side, and having that moment where it's almost like no one else was there, but the two of them, as they looked into each other's eyes and spoke about devoting their lives to each other. And he was dreaming about how now, 25 years later, he still is devoted to his husband as he was back then. And that they're on this long train journey, this dream journey they've saved every year. They've saved a little every year with the dream that on their 25th anniversary, they'll be able to have afforded to make this journey. And as he's dreaming that, so he wakes up just ever so slightly, hugs his husband tighter, snuggles up a little bit more, feels the warmth of his body, notices his husband just grab hold of his hand slightly while being hugged and then drifts comfortably and deeply asleep. And the next morning they awaken, they take a look at where they're at now, they can see that They've moved well on through the night, that they're now out into a more hilly area, just at the edge of the mountain range, where everything outside the windows is greener. Where if they look back towards the mountains, they can see the white tops of those mountains, 
but generally everything's greener and lush. That there appears to be a lot of water around here, probably rains a lot. And they head through to the main carriage. They have themselves some breakfast. They talk about how well they slept, the pleasant dreams that they'd had. They wished each other a happy anniversary. They looked forward to the rest of this day. And the train was due to stop at a station later on in the day. And while the train is stopped and being restocked with food and refueled and having more water put on the train, they get a chance to go and stretch their legs and explore. And the train will be in the station for six hours before they continue their journey. And after a while, the train arrives at the station, pulls into that station, and the couple get off the train, stretch their legs on the platform, feeling the warmth of the air here, surprised how warm it is, when just five or six hours earlier, they could see mountains. And as they go and explore the surrounding area, They walk into an area of tall grass. And while they're walking through this area of tall grass, they suddenly hear this loud boom, followed by a second boom. And they have this sense that they just saw something like a flash of light across the sky. And then they feel a shockwave pushed them back onto the grass. They can see that wave travel across the grass and travel through the trees. And as they sit up in the grass, they look around themselves to try and see what it was. And they notice this silver object hovering in the distance. And then in a blink of an eye, it appeared somewhere else, having disappeared where it was. And in a blink of an eye, it was somewhere else. And then in another blink of an eye, it was virtually over the top of them, lowering itself down into the tall grass. And they were surprised at how silent this giant silver object was as it settled down into that grass. And they watched as the side of it opened. And out walked some short and thin aliens that were barely taller than the grass. They watched as those aliens walked out into the grass, seemed to be looking at objects in their hands. And they explored the grass, seeming to scan the surroundings before getting back on to that ship, door closing behind them. And in a blink, that ship shot off again. And they didn't know what to think about this. The couple was silent for a while, not looking at each other, not talking to each other, just staring at the location of what they had just seen. And then after a little while, they turned to each other and they began talking about how incredible that was, how no one would believe them, how they never managed to get a camera out 
get the mobile phones out to take any photos. They were so shocked and stunned, they couldn't move. They just watched. And then one of them noticed that about four hours had passed. And that somehow time had disappeared. It didn't feel like more than a couple of seconds when those aliens came out of the ship, scanned and looked around, got back on the ship and left. And yet they could see on their watches that four hours had passed and they had to rush to get back to their train. So they rushed back to their train, boarded that train. And as the train set off, continued that journey, they talked about this alien encounter. They tried to wonder where the four hours went, how that time could have disappeared. And one of them said that they would try hypnosis, see if they can use hypnosis to uncover what happened during that period of time. And so one of them leaned over, lifted up their partner's arm, started touching gently on that arm, told their partner to gaze at the back of their hand. And as you gaze at the back of your hand, I'm going to just tap gently on the arm. And as I do, that arm can just float there relaxed in space and while that arm relaxes and floats in space you can drift deeper and more comfortably into the experience but don't let that arm begin to lower down any faster then you drift back to that moment in the field you drift back to that moment in the tall grass And as the arm began to lower down, so they began to drift back in their mind to that moment in the tall grass. As their arm reached the table and relaxed down, they were asked, so where are you? I'm in the tall grass, they responded. When are you at? We've just arrived in the tall grass. We've just heard the loud booms. We've just watched that craft dart unimaginably fast from place to place. And now it's landing in front of us. And tell me, slowly and gently, what happens next? The aliens have come out of their craft. They're scanning around. A purple pulse of light has come from the scanner they're using and passed us by. And my eyes flicker slightly as that purple pulse of light reaches me. And I'm walking towards the aliens and you're walking along with me. And the aliens are watching us head to them. And the aliens guide us onto the ship. And I can see the inside of the ship. And the aliens scan us with different items. And they measure us. They seem to weigh us. They take a close look at us. They wipe something on our skin. As if to be gathering a bit of our dead skin.
and they're doing this just slowly, gently. They seem to be so calm and relaxed around us. And we uh, stood there so calmly, so relaxed. And now they're showing us off the craft. They're showing us back out to where we were in the grass and I can see a slight hazy purple outline in the two locations that we were in the grass and those aliens seem to put us back just into those purple outlines and then they head back to their place and they press a button and that purple light begins to fade and just as the purple light fades back to their scanners they press a button on the scanner and then they turn and they head back into the craft and it shoots off And the person realises that more happened in that time that felt like a few seconds than they'd realised. And they bought their partner out of hypnosis. And the partner and themselves talked about that experience. The partner now with a memory of the whole experience. Shared what had happened. Being inquisitive about what they might have been after. Fascinated and excited by the experience they had just had. And so fascinated and so excited that much of the rest of the day's journey was missed through them talking to each other about encountering aliens. And as they went to bed that night, they settled down, fell asleep, slept incredibly well, knowing that this is the best 25 year anniversary present that you could possibly have. Not only getting this train trip they'd saved 25 years for, but also meeting aliens and having an encounter that very few others will have had and knowing that this is something that your partner knows and so you can share this with each other and you know that you believe each other that you've got this shared experience but knowing that it's something that'll be just your experience no one else would believe you and so you've always got this experience that's just yours that's private to the two of them and the next day they continue on their journey and the train stops again for another six hour stopover and they head out into a sparse open space they can see deer in the distance and they take some photos they have this feeling almost like they're on a safari taking photos of deer taking photos of wild horses taking photos of bird of prey circling overhead before boarding the train again for the last leg and the train travels along, they sleep overnight, one more night. The next day, arriving at the coast. And as they arrive at the coast, when they disembark the train, they head to their luxury hotel. They've booked as part of this journey. And they'll be following that train journey back 
the next day. And they enjoy their time in the hotel. They enjoy going and exploring this town. They enjoy the walk along the seafront at night, seeing the moon over the sea, the way it glistens and sparkles almost magically on the tips of the waves. And listening to those waves lapping onto the shore. Before heading back to the hotel, settling down for the night knowing they've got their journey home to look forward to. And the next day they wake up and they set off on their journey home. They enjoy their journey back, stopping at those same places on the way home. Only this time they had no alien encounter. And the timings were slightly different. And so this time they got to enjoy more of the mountains. They got to enjoy more of the bits that they passed through at night time before. That this time they were passing through at daytime. And at the end of their journey. They made their way back home. They relaxed down. They looked at the photographs they'd taken. They laughed. They reminisced. They hugged while watching video clips and photos. And they celebrated their 25 year anniversary and said they look forward to 25 more years and seeing what they get up to on their 50th anniversary. And that night they went to bed, settled down in bed and drifted and floated so peacefully and comfortably asleep, having had the experience of a lifetime. And while dreaming and relaxing about that experience and all that it entailed, they drifted and floated so deeply asleep, knowing that that experience and the peace and calm that it's brought and the feelings of love will seep into each coming day bring a smile to their face as they go about their daily business and they drift and float so peacefully and comfortably asleep